I've been working on this video on and off for the past two years, and it's finally here. This ranked video is based on how much fun I had with each game, and it should be noted that I have almost no biases since I didn't grow up with any Zelda games. So with all that said, grab some food and drinks because we're in for a long ride. Let's get her ranked. 35. Zelda's Adventure When I say I played every Zelda game, I'm including all three of the CDI titles too. And frankly, I've always been morbidly curious to try these out. And let me tell you, this isn't just the worst Zelda game. It's one of the worst games, period. It's so awful that I don't even know where to start. I guess we'll begin with the graphics. Holy crap, have they aged incredibly poorly. Everything you see are digitized screenshots, and it came out like a complete abhorrent mess of pixels. Some of the most unique factors of Zelda's adventure is that you play as Zelda, and it has cutscenes with in-game dialogue. These cutscenes are super cheesy, but they're not funny like the other CDI games. No, they just look really bland and poorly stitched together. And apparently, some of the actors were people that worked in the development office. The old guy is the sound composer. That is crazy, and really goes to show why Zelda's adventure is so unfinished looking. They must have had a tiny budget. It would be so fascinating to watch this game be developed at the time and see how and why they made the decisions they did. As for the gameplay, it may look like your typical top-down Zelda, and it kind of is, I guess, but it's done in the most obnoxious and painful way possible. First off, because everything is digital pictures, it's hard to tell what anything is. These are all just photographs that either don't move or are animated in the most jank way imaginable. And then there's the loading times. Good God. The game is constantly loading at pretty much all times. In fact, I'd argue that 60% of the time playing is just the game loading. And that's not an exaggeration. When you move to a different tile, it takes at least two to three seconds for the game to shift over and load all the assets. And not even just that, but the audio also stops. Yes, even the freaking audio gets halted every time you move squares. So that means you barely even hear the ambience or music because it's constantly getting cut off. And speaking of audio, there's barely anything to listen to at all. The music is pretty much just in the dungeons, while the overworld has a natural ambience like wind, water, and things like that. While this is a cool idea that actually works really well in the Breath of the Wild, it does not work at all when it's getting reset every time you're taking 10 steps. Dude, even pausing the game and moving your cursor is painfully slow. Seriously, look at how slow the cursor is moving. As for the actual music, it doesn't fit with the game at all, but some of it is all right. That is when I can hear it, because half the time the game is muted from all the loading. As for the sound effects, these are almost just as bad. When you hit enemies, they'll make the most ear-piercing annoying sound ever, or it just sounds like a human grunting. And then there's times where the background ambience plays over the sound effects and you hear nothing. The sound design is all over the place, let's just leave it at that. And then there's the voice acting. Instead of text boxes like every other Zelda title, there's no text at all. You have to listen to the NPCs talk to you. While this is kind of neat at first, this is yet another aspect that slows the game down. Oftentimes, the dialogue is said extremely slowly, and some of the actual acting is just awful or creepy. Hell, there were times where the dialogue was so quiet that I couldn't hear what they were saying. This game really made me appreciate Nintendo being one of the few big gaming companies to still utilize text boxes. Most AAA games have completely switched over to voice acting, which is great and all, but there's something I didn't realize that's great about just reading text from NPCs. Your imagination creates the voice of the character, and that's often more powerful than voice acting, especially when it isn't done well. I also noticed a weird trend of the NPCs saying they were bored, which I find to be super ironic. Oh, but what about the combat? I have I haven't even brought that up. Well, it's complete ass as you can see. You have a variety of items that you can attack with, but guess what? Most of them drain your rupees. Yes, you are literally punished for using anything but the basic weapon. The idea is to use other weapons like fire and the boomerang for specific enemies or bosses only. Why they actually went through with this is beyond me. Oh, and uh, real quick, let's talk about the bosses. These are also so incredibly lame and just really creepy too. Most of them have little monologues as you're fighting them, and it's so stupid to listen to them and then they die like three seconds later. And dude, the Ganon fight is just pathetic. All you do is hit him from the sides or back as he shoots these electric ball things, and then you win. It's not the worst Ganon fight ever, but it's down there. And speaking of dying fast, Zelda has no hit stun, so you can lose all your hearts in a matter of like one second if you aren't careful. And if you die, you go all the way back to the beginning. 
Oh boy, oh boy. Don't you just love when games do that? The only redeeming quality I can really give Zelda's Adventure is that a few of the dungeons have interesting themes. Like there's this one that's in a funhouse sort of place, which is kind of intriguing. It's just too bad the concept is trapped in this awful game, and the dungeons themselves barely qualify as dungeons to begin with. There's not really puzzles outside of the world's most basic block-moving ones that occasionally pop up. And on top of all that, this is one of those where do I go kind of games too. It's never that clear what to do or where you're supposed to go. This game is so forgotten about that even when you look for information about it online, you won't find much of anything, even on the dedicated wikis. I seriously cannot believe this game is real, and I will never touch it again. 34. Link, The Faces of Evil. Here we go. It's the funny game with all the funny cutscenes in it. It's actually kind of surreal to be playing it normally without seeing the cutscenes altered in some way. And man, The Faces of Evil is somehow worse than I expected, and I wasn't going into this with any real expectations. Just look at the title screen. Look at how plain it looks. Wow, a black background with 3D text for Link. And man, that font. What the hell were they thinking? This is barely legible, and it looks like crap. One of the most striking things about The Faces of Evil is just how awkward and creepy the cutscenes are. I don't even need to say anything, they speak for themselves. But over the years, I've grown a weird fondness of them. It's a style of its time, and while I don't think it's aged well at all, I can at least say that it stands out. At the very least, they made the scariest version of Ganon, whether ironic or not, just look at the guy. And also, why does the music go so hard? It doesn't fit with Zelda at all, but it kind of slaps. It has this weird 90s action movie vibe to it. I could listen to this on its own. As for the gameplay, well, that's where everything falls apart, if it didn't already. It's based around Zelda 2, which is an action-adventure game of sorts that heavily involves combat with some puzzle elements. The Faces of Evil doesn't really have puzzles per se, or if they do, they make no sense at all. The main thing you're doing is going around, looking for keys, collecting items, and taking wild guesses on what keys open what. Seriously, there's no clues on what doors go to what keys, or where the f*** you're supposed to go in general. I couldn't have gotten as far as I did without walkthroughs. This is one of the most confusing games I've ever played in my life. And don't even get me started on the controls. Holy sh**, they are absolutely atrocious. So you move around as normal, press 1 to jump, and press 2 to do everything else. You press 2 to use items, open doors, talk to people, and even pause the goddamn game. Well, technically you crouch and press 2, but you get my point here. But holy crap, it makes it so easy to do the wrong thing without meaning to. But what about jumping? Oh, yeah, that's easy. Just push up on the D-pad. Yes, you have to push up. There's no dedicated jump button. <laughs> you know, I'm surprised they didn't map that to the two buttons somehow. Imagine jumping with two as well. This leads to controls that are worse than even the NES games, and those certainly aren't anything to write home about either. Actually, going through the levels with these controls is bad enough, but then you realize how awful the collision is. Sometimes you'll hit enemies and your hit just won't connect for some reason, and your jump, oh my god, it's so pitifully bad. And look at how jank and unpolished the animation is. When Link's attacking, he turns into a hunchback for a brief moment. And then there's the rupees. Oh my god, they even messed this up. You can't just walk through a rupee to collect it. Oh no, that would be too simple. You actually have to stab it with your sword to collect it. Who the hell goes around stabbing their money to pick it up? And dude, this game is hard on top of all that. Link has virtually no hit stun, which means you can die in like one to two seconds if you don't take out the enemies at hand. The enemies are so off-putting to look at too, they don't really resemble Zelda enemies to begin with. And as if that wasn't enough, Link walks painfully slow. It takes forever to get around, which is just icing on the cake. When you're in caves, you have to constantly switch to your lantern to light them. In the area does not stay lit the whole time you're in one. At least the backgrounds look nice, despite it being hard to tell where you actually can stand sometimes. And you want to know how you beat Ganondorf at the end? You throw a book at him. Yep, I am dead serious. You throw one book at him and he dies. That has to be the most hilariously bad ending to a game I've seen in years. I knew going in that playing the CDI games weren't going to be a fun time, but I truly did not anticipate just how horrible and janky the experience was going to be. This is without a doubt one of the worst games I've ever played in my life. And that's saying a lot. I've played hundreds of games in my life thus far, and this and the other CDI Nintendo games are easily in the bottom 10. 
33. The Legend of Zelda The Wand of Gamelon There's really only a few reasons to claim that this game is somehow better. For one, you play as Zelda, which is kind of neat. And two, the cutscenes are funnier and more insane. Whatever I see, I shall devour. You've killed me! Good. It controls and plays identically too, which I guess would make sense. Even the menus are the same. The only differences are the cutscenes, locations, and a few key items. Now that I think about it, Wand of Gamelon and Faces of Evil could have almost been one big game instead of being split into two. And can we just talk about Zelda's sprite for a second? It barely resembles her at all. Her face just looks off. But I guess everything looks off in this game, so what does it matter anyway? So, yeah, I guess you could say that this game is better in quotations, but that's not really saying much. If anything, Zelda almost looks like Samus, which is a comparison I never thought I'd make in a million years. The ending is also just as great. Oh, just guess what happens. Instead of throwing a book at Ganon, you throw a wand at him instead. I mean, truly, just the perfect boss fight. It really sums up this entire game quite eloquently. 32. Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link I've heard that this game aged really bad, and now that I've played it, man, what a grueling experience. This is a very unusual Zelda game in almost every capacity. You don't even fight Ganon at the end. In fact, this Zelda in the first screen isn't the real Zelda. She's technically a different one called Princess Zelda 1. But anyway, this game is an action RPG where the goal is to find six crystals in order to get the Triforce of Courage. You'll do this by exploring different palaces, fighting enemies, and leveling up to get stronger and stronger. Now, I personally love the idea of a Zelda game in this style, but the execution, woo, it's pretty poor to say the least. The biggest issue comes down to the combat. Moving around and attacking feels decent, I guess? I mean, it's a big improvement over the first game at least, but let's talk about Link's sword. We're basically given a f***ing pencil. Why is it so short? I can't hit anything with this dinky little thing without getting up close and personal first. So many enemies are annoying to hit, and that problem comes down to the fact that Link's sword just has no reach. The Foca, Iron Knuckle, and Moblins are just a fraction of annoying enemies you have to attack. Pretty much all of them have longer range than you, and some even have shields that you have to swing around. So it goes without saying that this game will kick your ass and you're gonna learn to like it. You technically don't need to grind XP to beat the game, but I highly recommend it for at least a little bit at the beginning. What I did was hit these bubbles like a million times to level up, and I'm super, super thankful I did that. And speaking of the XP, it's very archaic near the end. Once you get to the last few palaces, it takes an incredibly long time to level up, and if you beat a boss and insert the crystal, all of your progress is wiped. Like, yeah, you're gonna level up still, but you lose all of your XP progress. So that definitely didn't make me feel like I was wasting my time. No, not at all. This one mechanic incentivized me to avoid attacking enemies as much as possible, because who cares, right? They're too tough to fight for what it's worth anyway, so instead I just breeze through the palaces to get the crystal and level up that way. Look, I've played way too many games where you're encouraged to avoid combat because the systems around it suck, and this is just another one of them to add to that list. Of all the things you can level up, one of them is magic, which is chewed up by your spells. There's a lot of really cool spells in this game, although the one called Spell is just hilarious. Yeah, you gotta use spell spell to make this house come out of the ground. And speaking of the houses, oh my god, the towns. They're nice to have included since you can heal for free, but most of the people have nothing to say. 90% just say hello, or quite literally, sorry, I know nothing. Well, what are you doing here to begin with then? and the text scrolls so slowly with no way to speed it up. Now, granted, there's not a lot of text in Zelda 2, so it's not that big of a deal, but it's still cumbersome. But with all that said, there are a couple of things I did enjoy about Zelda 2. The music is fantastic. Pretty much all of it is super memorable. And the bosses can be fun at times. I really enjoyed taking on Thunderbird, and Dark Link is a super cool idea. But my god, am I glad to have finished this, because I felt a sigh of relief afterwards knowing that I'll never have to play this again. Zelda 2 was simply a chore to get through. 31. The Legend of Zelda The very first Zelda, the one that started it all, and another one that sadly isn't worth playing anymore. If there's one word that describes this game perfectly, that word has to be jank. NES Zelda is incredibly janky in almost every way, and despite how frustrating the combat was near the end, I kind of enjoyed it? 
I don't know why, but it's got this weird charm to it that I can't really explain. So for starters, this is unlike most Zelda games because it's entirely open world, and you can go to any dungeon in pretty much any order. After experiencing this game, I can truly appreciate just how ambitious this idea was. In the 80s, people were used to things like Super Mario Bros. and Pac-Man. These are much more basic in concept and what people perceived as games, so it's crazy that this was pulled off at all. A lot of the core mechanics of Zelda have come from the first title, as you'd expect. You whack enemies with a sword, collect rupees, fight bosses in dungeons, and all that good stuff. Although ironically, it's really not that good. The combat is the biggest problem, which seems to be a recurring theme in bad Zeldas. It feels so inherently flawed and awkward. It's super easy to get hit by things and then die in a matter of seconds. Now of course, with some practice you can get used to the combat, but the reason it's annoying is because you can only move in four directions, so if you're trying to quickly swing around somebody to hit them and make some sort of getaway, that's not easy to do when you're locked to a grid. The Dark Nuts in particular are such a pain in the butt, because they can only be hit on the side and back because the front is deadly. But thankfully, most enemies just require you to learn their patterns. But even so, the hitboxes don't work very well. Often, you'll run over a rupee and not collect it because you aren't lined up perfectly, just as an example. Again, it all adds to the jankiness. And you're gonna need rupees to upgrade your sword, weapons, and other items that can be quite costly. Thankfully, there's a lot of areas where you can get big batches of rupees from so you don't need to farm enemies. But how do you find them? Well, I am not the person to answer that. I had a guide pulled up so that I knew where to burn all the completely random bushes and which random statue to slash so they'd reveal stairs. Oh yeah. This is one of those guide games. The secrets are incredibly obscure, and while the game does give you some tips to help, good luck deciphering them all. I swear to God, the old man's just talking out of his ass half the time. Nintendo has gotten much, much better with their puzzles in recent years, but this first game does nothing more but lay the groundwork for the future titles. And then there's the bosses. Oh my God, they are laughably easy. Most of them take one to two sword slashes, or just a couple of bombs. And that includes Ganon, which by the way, I love his pixel art. Even he takes four sword slashes and one arrow. So I guess that's kind of a negative, but in a way I don't really mind that much. My perspective is that the main objective isn't to fight a crazy boss fight, it's to celebrate successfully exploring the dungeon and making your way through all the rooms. So do I have anything positive to say about the NES Zelda? Well, the music is infectious, despite there only being three or four songs. It's the classics we're all familiar with, and it's by far the best aged part of the game. And even though I've described how janky it can be to play, I'm still glad to have finally played it after all these years of wondering what it was like. It's impressive for its time, but simply isn't worth going back to. Honestly, Nintendo should heavily consider remaking this like they did with Link's Awakening. They could definitely do that and make some of the secrets a bit more obvious and make the combat smoother. Then maybe this would be worth playing. 30. My Nintendo Picross, The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. Yep, I'm even counting this one. Odds are, you have no idea that this is an actual game, and there's a good reason why. When the 3DS launched, it was a My Nintendo reward, and you'd have to spend 1,000 platinum points to download it. What we have here is Midna telling me how to play Picross. This crossover makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, but it's also kind of charming. It feels like a weird throwback to the 90s and 2000s, where every popular Nintendo game would get a random pinball title or a random puzzle game. It's neat to see that happen in the 2010s. Now, look. I like puzzle games quite a bit, but I had never played Picross before. I tried this for like an hour, and just could not get the hang of it. I started to somewhat understand how the game worked, but I think I need to sink more hours in to really get a good grasp. But for what it is, it's a fun little title. The sound effects and music all come from Twilight Princess, and because it's on a touchscreen, it's very seamless to tap the boxes compared to using a D-pad. And the pictures that you carve out are all Zelda-related, as you'd guess. There's a few different puzzle sizes, and even this Micross mode, where you have to solve puzzles inside of a puzzle to form a much bigger image. I also got a chuckle out of seeing the option to post your puzzles on Miiverse, rest in peace to the GOAT. But yeah, this might be ranked higher on your list if you're into Picross, but I'm not one of those people. It feels weird to rank this above both of the NES Zeldas, but honestly, I think I'd rather play this again than those two. 29. Link's Crossbow Training. I have a soft spot for this one. This game will take you less than an hour to beat, but man is it so enjoyable the whole way through. Crossbow Training was famously bundled in with the Wii Zapper. Which, hey, packaging Zelda with a plastic peripheral was a pretty smart move on Nintendo's end. I don't think I would have bought this otherwise. It's kind of uncomfortable to hold for long periods of time. 
but on to the game itself. It's an on-rails shooter where you go around shooting targets or enemies. But it's not even completely on-rails. There's some levels where you actually move around and have to take out a bunch of baddies before the time runs out. While I'm not super good at aiming, it's pretty accurate and is aged well. Link's crossbow training really pairs well to play after beating Twilight Princess, because all the locations and enemies come from it. It was really cool to be able to fight off a Dark Nut and go back to City in the Sky and Temple of Time. I didn't realize just how impactful Twilight Princess's dungeons were until seeing them again in this new light. But once you've played through all 30 levels, there's not much else to do unless you want to go for gold medals. You know, I actually remember getting all the gold medals when I was a kid playing this at a friend's house. Ah, good times back then. But alas, there's nothing else to do besides play multiplayer or practice individual levels, which is why I'm ranking it so low. 28. The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening DX I won't be counting the original version since DX has an extra dungeon and a few quality of life improvements, because otherwise, it's exactly the same with more colors. For a Game Boy game, I'm really impressed with how much Zelda-ness was included. This came out after A Link to the Past, so it has a lot of the same tropes from that game, and it's still filled to the brim with secrets and memorable locations. In some ways, I kind of like the combat more than A Link to the Past. Link's sword swing hitbox is just a tad more generous, which makes Link's attacking most enemies really fun. One of the most distinct parts about A Link's Awakening is that the story is very different with Marin playing a big role, and there's tons of Mario enemies. It's pretty surreal realizing that. Like, we immediately find a Chain Chomp pet just as an example. And later on, you'll stop on Goombas, there's Cheap Cheap and Angler's Tunnel, and you can even get a Yoshi doll in a crane game. It's strange, but also really neat with how many Mario characters are included. Heck, you even get to have a pet Chain Chomp for a brief moment, and it helps take out enemies. Imagine if regular Mario games let us have pet chain chomps, that'd be awesome. I'm also a big fan of the music as it's all pretty catchy. But being on the Game Boy, A Link's Awakening has its quirks. The bosses are ridiculously easy. Even the final boss I knocked out on my first try with almost no trouble. But the biggest issue, however, is the weapon system. If you want to switch weapons, you have to pause the game and switch to another button. This might not sound like that big of a deal, but you're required to swap stuff out constantly. Half of the game is just staring at the weapon screen, and it becomes a massive slog by the end. It's a limitation that the Game Boy couldn't really get around, unfortunately, due to its lack of buttons, but it hinders the experience pretty badly. Some weapons should have just automatically worked, like the power bracelet, but I digress. Even so, there's so much charm in this game. Like at one point, you literally pick up Marin, which was cracking me up, and you can steal an expensive bow from an item shop only to walk back in, immediately die, and your name is forever changed to Thief. Ugh, why can't games do silly things like this more often? I even enjoyed the ending, despite it being a bit somber considering your entire adventure to be nothing more than a dream. There's not really a reason to play this version of A Link's Awakening since the remake exists, but it's still pretty impressive for its time. 27. The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Seasons So, fun fact, this is actually the very first Zelda game I ever played. I got it when I was like 6 or 7, and I remember absolutely hating it. Yeah, this one game is the reason I was a Mario kid and not a Zelda kid. And what's stranger is I remembered literally nothing about it until I entered the hero's cape. Out of nowhere, core memories were getting unlocked left and right, and I don't think I ever got past this point. The only question to myself is, uh, how? This cave takes like two minutes to get through, but whatever. Oracle of Seasons is clearly built off Link's Awakening and controls virtually the same, but there's a lot of differences that make it stand out. For one, it's nice that you can pick your message speed right from the very start. Then of course, there's the Season of Rods that lets you change seasons on the spot. Or, well, okay, you actually have to be standing on these tree stumps specifically, because it doesn't work anywhere else for some reason. But it's a really cool mechanic as it'll change what paths you can take within the world you're in. Winter will add piles of snow everywhere, spring brings flowers, summer will drain water in areas which makes them accessible, and that's just the basics. I also really like that there isn't a rupee limit. After playing Ocarina of Time and other Zelda games, it's nice to have a big wallet. Although the lack of fairy bottles is a little dumb, especially when you're learning the bosses. Going back to the overworld, it seems like the general structure is better condensed than Link's Awakening. Maybe I've just gotten more accustomed to this kind of Zelda, but it feels a lot easier to get around with more memorable locations. While playing, you'll find a large variety of rings as well. 
These can be attached to yourself and will do things like boost your attack or defense, although I don't understand why these rings have to be appraised before using them, which can only be done at one shop in the entire game. Like, come on, just let me use the rings and move on. There's also animal friends. I just about busted a gut watching Link jump inside of a kangaroo, leaving only his tiny head sticking out. And I also really enjoyed the bosses. There's some decent music in here, with Horon Village being a standout for me. It has massive Pokemon energy and the way it's composed, which I guess makes sense because Red and Blue are on the Game Boy as well. But as I said with Link's Awakening, the biggest glaring issue is the drawbacks of just being on a Game Boy. The extra colors are a solid upgrade, of course, but pausing to swap items hasn't gone away. This was really obnoxious in Link's Awakening, and it's not any better in Oracle of Seasons. Like, seriously, why do I need to swap to a power bracelet to just pick up a rock? Why can't I just have the ability permanently once I get to that point in the game? I'll reiterate that I'm fully aware that this is not a Game Boy, it only has two face buttons, I know this, but it doesn't change the fact that it deters from the experience. A lot of the items are also reused, which is to be expected, but some of the new ones are really cool. My favorite was definitely the magnetic gloves. It's fun to just fly around huge gaps, and it made for some creative puzzles in the dungeons. But speaking of the dungeons, man, sometimes I wonder if 2D Zelda just isn't for me. I'd say like half the dungeons were really fun, and half of them were a chore or had really nitpicky enemies. Which is also funny because Oracle of Seasons is supposed to be combat focused, yet it's filled with puzzles. Some of these puzzles and dungeons are really tedious to get through, and after finishing one, I didn't feel much drive to start the next one. I think the issue with them was just the sheer length, and a lack of health pickups made it really easy to die. And same thing with the side quests too. I did some of them and got the heart pieces, but by the end I just didn't have much desire to do them all. The last thing to mention is the linked game with both Oracle titles. After beating the game, you get a password. This password basically allows you to make a save file that lets you get access to better weapons and play extra bosses at the end. So you basically have to play both games twice to experience all of it. It's not a lot of missing content, but the idea of being forced to play both games twice with little difference is pretty stupid. I would have loved to just have access to the Master Sword and fight Ganon as the secret boss, but no, these games had to copy Pokemon. This and Oracle of Ages desperately need full-blown remakes like Link's Awakening got on the Switch. They have so much potential to shine with better graphics and quality of life updates. The concept is still really great and there were some fun moments, but Oracle of Seasons really struggled to hold my attention. 26. The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Ages I'm very surprised to be ranking this as the better of the Oracle titles, but it honestly is. It tells a more compelling story, the time-traveling mechanic is more interesting and functional than the Rod of Seasons, and I enjoy the dungeons a bit more as well. Although frankly, both games are so similar that you could be a bigger fan of either or. The biggest difference really just comes down to the time traveling. Around halfway through the game, you can use it in pretty much any spot on the map. This alone makes the core mechanic feel a lot more freeing and fun to experiment with. I also love how this tree is in love with Link, that's just adorable. And like with Oracle of Seasons, the dungeons are pretty tough, but use the items in a lot of creative ways. I also enjoyed the boss fights, just like with Seasons. My biggest qualm with Oracle of Ages is that the later dungeons feel way, way too long. This was an issue with Oracle of Seasons, but that is tenfold a problem in ages. Now, I genuinely think this is just my personal taste, and I'll get into why in a second. But first, let's talk about Mermaid's Cave. I loathe this dungeon. Having to switch back and forth between the past and present is a novel idea, but it adds an obnoxious amount of backtracking because you have to leave the dungeon to do it. In Jabu Jabu's Belly was the same idea, but instead we're forced to swim through half of it. And you might think, oh, well, what's wrong with a bit of swimming? Oh, I'll tell you what's wrong with it. You want to know how to swim? Tap the f***ing D-pad in the direction you want to go. That's right, there's no, ooh, let me just push my way around. No, 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 no. You must tap to constantly get through the water. This wouldn't have been that big of a problem if swimming wasn't such a core part of the dungeon either. The controls just feel awkward. But thankfully, this is just the overworld swimming. 2D swimming lets you push A to actually gain speed in the water, and that's fine. Those two dungeons in particular might be incredibly enjoyable for Zelda veterans, but I found them to be beyond tedious and a huge drag. That kind of sums up the Oracle games. They're way too cryptic and too frustrating for the average person. By the end, I just wanted to finish Oracle of Ages and just move on with my life. And like with Seasons, there's a linked game where you can play the game a second time to get the secret Ganon boss, but there's no way I'm doing that. I'll say what I said before, it's time for Nintendo to remake these two games and modernize them so they can be better enjoyed. 
25, Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition. While of course the original is on the Wii U, and a port with extra content is on the 3DS, I'll only be going over the Switch version. If you don't know what this is, well, you're basically slashing away at a thousand enemies a second. The amount of Zelda characters this game has is pretty staggering. The character choices really range quite a bit from tons of different Zelda titles. Some characters are as common as Ganondorf, Darunia, and Rudo, to much more obscure choices like Skull, Tingle, and Marin. The variety is really nice to see, and the locations are also somewhat based on several different areas from other Zelda games. There's a ton of different ways to upgrade your characters, give them different moves, and make them a lot stronger. There's also a huge upgrade from the previous versions of Hyrule Warriors, which is being able to swap characters on the fly. This is super handy, and I can't imagine playing Hyrule Warriors without the ability to do that. Also, Linkle was introduced in this game, which is really random, but just so happens to be one of the most fun characters to use. Hyrule Warriors has a handful of little cutscenes, which really helps bring everything to life since you're mostly just mindlessly pushing the attack button over and over. While of course you can still do combos with your attacks, and there are specific missions and sick bosses, this is still a very repetitive kind of game. There's something to be said about slashing away at hundreds of enemies at once. It kind of just feels really good to do. But that's also basically the only thing you're doing. There is, of course, an extra adventure mode and a few other challenges to help spice things up, but you're really just mashing the attack button over and over again. And good luck 100%ing this, by the way. It would literally take you hundreds of hours, which is pretty nuts for a Nintendo game. So look, I can really appreciate Hero Warriors, but it's something that I only enjoy tackling in small spurts. 24. Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity I already know this is going to be a massive hot take, but I honestly enjoyed this more than Hyrule Warriors. Right off the bat, I will admit, the frame rate is super, super rough. And I mean that literally. From the beginning, the frames drop quite a lot, and it doesn't get much better throughout the whole game. But I didn't find it to be unplayable, maybe just a bit jarring. I've heard that people that are very familiar with the Dynasty Warrior games can't really play this because of the frame rate issue, but this is only my second Dynasty Warrior styled game, so I don't know. I'm not that much of a stickler for that crispy 60 FPS, but even still, it's shocking that more time wasn't spent on optimizing this for a smoother frame rate. This is an action game after all. You'd think that'd be a higher priority, but I digress. The reason I like this game more comes down to the story and the atmosphere. Instead of playing as random Zelda characters in some random Zelda-esque locations, you are actually in Breath of the Wild's world. Not only are the locations exactly the same and look the part, but the entire experience is the same. The way the menus look, all the sound effects, the moves you have, heck, you can even utilize the Sheikah Slate for additional attacks. Because the theme is so focused and well executed, I don't mind that the frame rate is so bad. And can we talk about the little guardian that follows us around this whole time? He's so cute! Oh my goodness! Cooking from Breath of the Wild is also an Age of Calamity, but it's done a bit differently. You'll collect materials in battle, and craft those to make meals that can enhance your stats. It's a pretty smart way of integrating it, honestly. Heck, there's even Korok seeds! As for the story, well, it technically takes place before Breath of the Wild, but it's not canon. The cutscenes are really well presented, and there's a ton of them that wrap the plot together nicely. Because it's not canon, the ending makes literally no sense because the champions survive, so this is basically a massive fanfiction and I was really digging it, with the main focus being on Zelda. She's the one character that goes through the most growth and development, so it's easy to attach yourself to her as you're playing. She goes from not understanding how to use her powers and being envious of Link, to eventually figuring it out and helping stop Ganon. And did I mention that you can control the Divine Beasts? It's only for certain parts of the game, but this is awesome! Just blasting away at hundreds of thousands of enemies as a massive machine, I've never felt more powerful. But with all that said, this is still a Dynasty Warriors game. Most of it is slicing up baddies over and over without much variety in between. But man, the story and the theming really made this one a lot more special than the original Hyrule Warriors. Here's the hoping that on Switch 2, Age of Calamity can be played at a smooth 60 frames so more people will be willing to give this a shot. 23. The Legend of Zelda Triforce Heroes This is a really wonky one. It's a Zelda game that's meant to be played with three people, although you can technically play it solo. Solo is playing the same game but in slow motion. I kind of wish you could move all the characters at the same time like with Four Swords Adventures. But alas, instead of going through the usual overworld and dungeons, you're essentially plowing through a bunch of levels with basic puzzles. It's similar to something like Four Swords or Four Sword Adventures, but I don't think the formula works quite as well as those games. 
games. First off, actually playing it with three people is almost impossible nowadays. I tried it out with Nintendo and D-Pad Gamer, and let's just say that there was an obnoxious amount of lag with the setup we were forced to use, and it didn't work very well. A lot of these puzzles involve hitting switches with specific items, or just killing all the enemies on screen. You'll occasionally have to find keys for doors, but otherwise there isn't much for clever puzzles. You'll also do a lot of totem stacking, which is just picking up players to throw them to higher ledges, or maybe just reaching chests and things like that. And there's no jumping, so this is one of the few ways to get height. Now for a game like this, it makes more sense for this to be an action puzzle type of ordeal. A typical Zelda game with multiple people would get really messy if you had to solve complex puzzles that required good timing with every player. And that's where the end of Triforce Heroes gets really annoying. The puzzles get a bit more complicated, and I don't think it works in the game's favor very well. I found it to be fairly frustrating at times, simply because you have to rely on everybody so heavily to make progress. Which, obviously, that is kind of the entire point of the game, but I felt it was pushed too far in the later levels. I'd still say that the game is fairly fun, but it's not gonna blow your socks off. You have a bunch of items too, as you'd expect, and I really liked using the water rod because you could summon water anywhere and get much needed height. But man, throwing stuff was really stupid at times. You will always throw either partners or bombs at an arc, and you can't just set it down normally. Why not? This is either an insane oversight, or none of us figured out which button drops stuff. But hey, at least we got outfits! The outfits not only add a lot of personality to Link's character, but also have extra abilities. The best one by far is, of course, Cheerleader Link. I mean, just look at him. So with all that said, I don't mind Triforce Heroes. It's at the very least a competent game, it just stinks that it's so hard to play properly nowadays. 22. The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening Switch how anybody can find the original version on the Game Boy to be better is beyond me. This is the definition of a remake that completely replaces the original. First off, I really love the adorable art style. I can see how the cutesiness may put off some, but I think it works well considering this is a smaller, bite-sized game. And man, that intro cutscene is just breathtaking. I'd love to see an entire 2D Zelda show with this animation. So right off the bat, the game looks exquisitely better. We're playing in widescreen, and there's no more screen scrolling except in the dungeons, which makes moving around much more seamless. The biggest issue with the original is the obnoxious amount of button swapping you had to do. That has been completely remedied. B is always mapped to your sword, shield is R, and L is used for dashing. You can still change items with X and Y, but it doesn't have to happen every five seconds. This one change plus the more free-flowing camera makes this remake like 100 times better. The world map is a lot clearer too, and you can make markers which is kind of neat. Now of course, no game is perfect, and there are some really strange quirks with this one. The most noticeable one being the frame drops, but they only happen when you're entering new areas for a brief second or so. I also noticed a couple of frame drops in the dungeons too, which I found to be really odd. It doesn't really hurt the game, but I don't understand why this wasn't optimized better. There's been a weird issue going on with modern Zelda games having issues with frame rates, but it's especially bizarre in this case considering how much smaller scale Link's Awakening is. And I gotta be honest, the movement really should have been a full 360 degrees. Having eight directions to move around with is obviously obviously nicer than 4 and it gets the job done, but I don't see why they didn't go the extra mile and let us move in any direction. And you can't even use the D-pad to move, which makes this even more confusing. One of the main things added to this remake is that you can make a dungeon, and I tread on the word make very lightly. The way that it works is that with any of the dungeons that you've already gone through, you can take those rooms and kind of mix them up. Oh boy, wow, that, that sure sounds fun. Yeah, this has to be the lamest way to make a dungeon ever. Why can't you move the actual stuff in the rooms around, and maybe have enemies and keys spawn in different areas? It's an interesting idea to have a dungeon maker in concept, but the execution just doesn't really work. It just kind of feels like it was thrown in very haphazardly. There's also a lot more seashells to find, which I'm honestly indifferent to, but I guess is handy compared to the original. And that's really all I have to add. While this is one of my favorite Switch games now, and basically fixed every problem the original had, it is still a Game Boy game. The world feels very small, especially since you see much more of it at once. That grandiose feeling is a little dissipated, which is fine in this context, but there's plenty of other Zelda games I'd play again over this one. 21. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask not gonna lie, I'm a little concerned about the Majora's Mask fans watching. Please hear me out before bringing out the pitchforks. This just might be one of the greatest Zelda games of all time. The only problem with that is it's one of the worst games to actually play. 
So I'm put into this infinitely difficult conundrum on where to rank this. To start though, I really love how this cover is holographic. Maybe this is just the 90s kid in me, but anytime I see this I get mesmerized for like 5 minutes. But anyway, this is a Zelda game where you don't fight Ganon and you don't save Zelda. Instead, you have to save Termina from a moon that's going to crash down and destroy everything. So you have to find the 4 giants in each dungeon to save Termina and defeat the Masked Skull Kid. And you only have 3 days to do it. Yeah, literally. The 3 day time mechanic is so incredibly unique that I have never seen another game even attempt to do something similar. If you let the timer sink down to the end, I kid you not, the last 6 minutes are the most dreadful, doom defying, and existential moments I've ever experienced in a video game. The clock tower ticks down, the sky is painted a harsh red, and the most somber music kicks in, making you feel like nothing can be saved and you'll inevitably collapse. You feel the earth shaking, the townspeople People are panicking, and there's nothing you can do. It's beautiful just how impacting this moment is. I've never felt more uneasy or filled with despair when playing a game, period. But not all hope is lost, because the Ocarina of Time is vital to saving the day, or three days, technically. By playing an inverted version of the Song of Time, you can slow down time, which relieves some of the game's initial pressure. But you're gonna have to keep resetting time, which will get rid of your rupees and other consumable items you previously had. The only way to save your rupees is to give them to the banker, which I don't even know how the banker can keep them because he also gets reset, but don't worry about that, it's fine. So what this game boils down to is completing a lot of side quests to find masks and heart pieces, and finishing one dungeon at a time before being forced to reset time. What also makes this game special is how involved you get with the characters. So many of the side quests include doing things for people at specific periods of the three day cycle, which can be super convoluted at times, but it also keeps you really invested. And let's also keep in mind that Majora's Mask introduced Tingle, one of the most legendary video game characters ever. But despite all of that and how incredible I've made the game sound, I feel no desire to go back and replay Majora's Mask. That's because without a guide, figuring out what the hell to do is super time consuming and straight up obnoxious. Despite how interesting a lot of the side quests are, a lot of them are exhausting to actually complete because of their difficulty or they just take too long. As for the dungeons, these suckers are massive, and even when you slow down time, it feels very tense to actually complete them. The last couple dungeons in particular have really clever puzzles, but are so perplexing that I couldn't imagine myself figuring this out without some help. But this game is definitely worth 100%ing at least once in your life, because you're rewarded with some cool masks. The bunny hood is amazing since it increases your running speed, the blast mask is like having infinite bombs, and of course there's the fierce Didi mask. This one makes fighting Majora stupidly easy, but because it takes so much effort to find all the masks, it's one of the most satisfying and bizarre ways for it all to end. Some of the music is repurposed from Ocarina of Time, but the new stuff is fantastic too. Clocktown's comfortable instrumental really makes you feel like you're visiting Grandma's house. The Happy Mask Salesman's mystical yet enticing tune creates this moment where you feel forced to trust this mysterious man with Mario's face crusted behind him, oh god. So despite how fantastic Majora's Mask is, I really can't recommend playing it because of how much of a headache it is to sift through. This is a game I don't think I'd ever enjoy playing unless I already knew exactly what to do off the top of my head. That's why it's so difficult for me to put this game below the halfway point on the list, because actually playing it did nothing but stress me out. I wasn't having fun with it. I didn't really enjoy it that much until looking back and being done with it. 20. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask 3D The only game more decisive than Majora's Mask has to be Majora's Mask 3D. Despite the issues this remake has, I still find it to be a slightly better remake. It makes some weird mistakes which are annoying to put up with, but I don't think any of them bring the game down enough to make it worse than the original. To start, the movement feels a little bit slower. This isn't really a problem, but I definitely miss being able to spin as the Deku scrub and get a little burst of speed from that. It feels a bit off since I played the original already, but it's not really a problem when actually playing. Then of course I have to talk about the ice arrows, which is the one part of the game that I'm baffled by. You could normally shoot these arrows anywhere in the water to make your own platforms, which logically makes sense, but in Majora's Mask 3D, you can only fire the arrows in predetermined spots. Like, what? Not only does this dumb the game down, but it literally makes no sense. What's different between this patch of water and this patch of water? No comprende, Mr. Reggie! Zora swimming is also a bit slower and chews up magic when going faster, which is disappointing, but again, it didn't really hinder the game. 
As someone that has not played the original religiously, I thought this change was fine. A couple of bosses have also added new phases like Georg and Twin Mold, which is honestly kind of cool. Although adding eyeballs to every boss is a bit of an odd choice, I don't think that was really necessary. But outside of those qualms, I really liked all the other changes. As you can see, the game itself looks miles better than it did on N64, the animations are cleaner, and the frame rate is a solid 30 FPS compared to 20 FPS beforehand. The music is pretty much the same as well, albeit it's a tiny bit muffled because, well, it's on 3DS. The touchscreen is super handy for quick item swapping and peeking at the map whenever you need to. It also makes playing the ocarina easier since you can look at the notes of each song while you're playing the song. I also really like the new owl statues as they're used for saving, which is much more straightforward. My favorite changes have to be from the inverted Song of Time and Song of Double Time. The inverted Song of Time will slow down time even more compared to the original, which is a big stress reliever and really helpful when lost in a dungeon. And look, I get that the entire point of the game is that you're supposed to be constrained under a time limit, but man, some of these dungeons can get so confusing, and I tend to think less critically when I'm under the pressure of the stupid timer. So I'm very glad that I don't have to think about that as much. And then for the Song of Double Time, it lets you skip to any hour you want. This is exactly what the original needed for completing the side quest. These side quests are worth doing to get all the masks, but there was so much wasted time in the original where you just had to sit around and wait until a certain point in the day to talk to a certain character to finish some quest. Not only is that not a problem now, but the Bomber's Notebook also makes it easier to keep track of all the side quests. Heck, if you really want, you can schedule out when certain events are going to happen. What I find so incredibly fascinating about Majora's Mask 3D is that most of these quality of life features that I've just mentioned are the very reason that so many people adamantly prefer the original. The N64 version is a lot tougher to get through, and I can respect those that prefer that kind of experience. But for me, I'm no Majora's Mask connoisseur, so having these updates in the gameplay makes Majora's Mask much more approachable. I think it really boils down to nostalgia, and I'm 100% guilty of this too. I prefer Mario 64 vastly over Mario 64 DS, but that's just because I like the quirky controls the original has while the DS version dumps things down a bit. It's the same idea with both versions of Majora's Mask. 19. The Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass I already know some of you are going to be very confused on why I'd put this above Majora's Mask, so let me explain. This is yet another Zelda game I remember reading about in Nintendo Power, but never had the chance to try it. And as soon as the title screen said to touch, I instantly recalled why I didn't bother as a kid. This entire game, well, like, okay, maybe 99% of the game, is controlled with the bottom screen. You move, attack, talk to NPCs, use items, literally everything is done with a touchscreen, outside of pausing and pulling up a couple of menus. It's very jarring that the game takes place on the bottom screen, but it kind of has to for it to work at all. Not being able to use the D-pad to move is honestly pretty annoying, but at least it does the job. Although good luck doing somersaults, you're supposed to do tiny circles at the edge of the screen and they straight up don't work most of the time. The controls overall aren't broken or bad, it's just very clunky to play. This game might look alright too, but what you're seeing on screen right now is not how it looks when you're actually playing. It's easy to forget that when watching footage online, you have to take into account that we all have big chunky hands that cover up half the screen, so it's hard to see where you're going because of that. That's probably the worst aspect of the touchscreen, because everything else Phantom Hourglass throws at you is some of the most clever and ingenious uses of the touchscreen and microphone that I've ever seen a DS game pull off. First off, you always have a map at the top so you can see where you're going, but not just that. Oh no, you can quite literally write down notes and markers on the map yourself. This is genuinely amazing. Being able to add your own notes adds so much immersion and creates a better inner feeling that you're actually going on an adventure and figuring out where to go. When you get mail, sometimes you have to leave a signature, which is just adorable. Then of course there's that one puzzle that everyone remembers where you have to stamp something on a map by closing your DS and opening it back up. I mean dude, talk about perfectly utilizing the DS hardware. I also love how you have to actually yell or blow at the mic to stun the pole's voice, and even to purchase the salvage arm for cheaper. Yes, you can literally get a discount on the salvage arm by just yelling louder. That's hilarious. Then of course there's the dungeon where you have to draw your way around to hit all the eyeballs. I could list off examples of amazing touchscreen integration for ages. This game simultaneously has some of the most clever and enjoyable dungeons in the entire franchise, but also controls in the most awkward way imaginable. 
And speaking of dungeons, let's talk about the Temple of the Ocean King. If you've played Phantom Hourglass before, you already know where I'm going with this. This is a dungeon that you're forced to replay six times over. And not only that, but each time gets increasingly longer as you unlock more items that allow you to make further progress. I honestly don't know how to feel about this. On one hand, the execution of this idea is beyond irritating and tedious because you're playing the same floors over and over again. And to make it worse, we're on a time limit, and these phantoms take away a bunch of time if they hit you. It almost feels like we're playing a super slow version of Metal Gear Solid. But here's the thing, by the end of the game, I started to kind of like Ocean King. On the fourth and fifth run through, I was devoid of any excitement to go through all the floors again with slight differences, but then everything changes on the sixth and final run. You finally get access to the Phantom Sword and you can destroy the Phantoms in one hit. They're the main reason why this dungeon sucks because it's so much waiting for them to move into areas where they can't spot you, but now we can just straight up slash them all. It's unbelievably satisfying and kind of redeems the entire dungeon. Outside of Ocean King though, all the other ones are an absolute blast. They use items in so many creative ways that make these dungeons a hoot. In the Ice Temple, you can use the hookshot as a freaking slingshot. That's just sick. But enough about that. I barely talked about the graphics or sailing. The graphics are trying to emulate the Wind Waker, but obviously they can't look as smooth and nice. Link's face alone is super weird looking, but the 3D models themselves are just okay. It's the DS. I can't really fault it considering how few 3D games even exist on the handheld. They're at the bare minimum. Something else I noticed right away is that the level and enemy designs are slightly more simplified, which makes sense because we're playing a bit slower due to the handicap of being on a touchscreen. That's probably why a game like this would never get remade. It's really only built for something like the DS. And now we gotta talk about the sea. First and foremost, I'm getting massive Sonic Rush Adventure vibes from this game, which is crazy because the games came out only a few months apart, but like with The Wind Waker, you sail from island to island, but mechanically it plays very different. You draw out your paths, and you don't have to worry about wind at all. You just fight the occasional enemy, and that's about it. The sea itself is also much smaller, which is kind of nice because it gets tiring to go sailing. And same as the Wind Waker, you can also salvage for treasure after finding their treasure maps. Instead of simply going to the right spot and getting the loot, you first have to play a little mini game and avoid a bunch of spikes. The mini game doesn't overstay its welcome and is pretty enjoyable. And can we just real quick talk about Nintendo DS Island? Like, dude, they made a freaking island shaped around a DS. That is the most charming Nintendo thing I've seen in a while. As for the music, I don't have much to say about it. Some of it comes from Wind Waker, and some of it are remixes or original pieces. It's all fine for what it is. And on top of all that, there's even a battle mode. This is pretty interesting. You're pitted inside an arena and take turns playing as either Link or the Phantoms. Whoever can move the most force gems to their zone wins. What makes this so unique is that there's a surprising amount of strategy. Some force gems are heavier than others, and when you're the Phantom, you can control three of them all at once. The idea is to basically see who can outsmart each other the most. While some of the maps were pretty unfair as Link, it was solid fun for just packing it in as a bonus. I gotta say, I was really impressed with Phantom Hourglass. I didn't think I'd end up liking it as much as I did. At least it's a little more fun to play compared to constantly being confused in Majora's Mask. I just wish we could at least move and do basic attacks with the buttons and then maybe keep the touch screen for just the items. 18. The Legend of Zelda Spirit Tracks It's a Zelda game, but with trains. Not exactly a concept I thought would ever exist, but here we are. It came out after Phantom Hourglass did, and I found it to be slightly more enjoyable. For starters, instead of sailing around islands to get to towns and dungeons, you take a train. This is... um, pretty weird, but also kind of cool at the same time. What other game can you think of that allows you to travel by train tracks? And my god, the music absolutely hits. If there's anything Spirit Tracks got right, it's this one infectious song. As for the gameplay, well, the train is honestly pretty slow. There's a level that increases the speed, but I barely noticed a difference. However, over time things get interesting when choo-chooing around the world. You'll eventually get a cannon and can shoot at stuff, then there's this part where these pirates get on board and you have to fight them off. You've also got these bunnies you can catch, and there's plenty of enemies to take out too. The most iconic obstacles are these possessed trains that can blow you up in one hit, so you have to carefully navigate around them to survive. I have no idea what the consensus is on the train gameplay, but I found it to be slightly more enjoyable than sailing in Phantom Hourglass. At least there's a bit more variety. As for the rest of the game, it controls exactly like the DS counterpart. You move, attack, talk to NPCs, and do everything on the touchscreen. 
again. The only thing I noticed that's different was that you can push A through dialogue, and I don't think that was possible in the other DS Zelda. I don't know, I could be wrong, but I don't think that worked before, as if that really matters. Just like last time, moving around like this can be cumbersome and tedious after a while. But hey, our side character is Zelda. Yes, Zelda herself joins us on this adventure. Well, okay, kind of. Her body has been stolen, so our goal is to get her body back. She travels around as a ghost, and will occasionally offer clues, some witty humor here and there, and can even possess entire phantoms. One, I'm just realizing this is where the phantom attack from Smash Bros comes from, but two, this is awesome! Using Phantom Zelda with Link to solve puzzles is really fun, and makes for some pretty tough sections near the end of the game. The dungeon that you control phantoms in is the Temple of Spirits. If you remember the Ocean Temple King from Phantom Hourglass, I really hated that it was on a timer and you had to replay levels so many times. The Temple of Spirits is is the same concept, but fixes those two big flaws. There's no time limit, and you only tackle new floors each time you travel back. This one aspect makes this game slightly better than Phantom Hourglass. It's pretty much as good as this dungeon style is ever gonna get. Just like before, there's a lot of drawing on your map to take notes, and silly gimmick things with a mic. Like at one point, you have to actually talk to a fortune teller just as one example. And speaking of the mic, I gotta talk about the spirit flute. It's the same idea as the ocarina or any instrument Link gets in any of the Zelda games, but this flute is special. It has by far the most creative utilization of any instrument I've seen from the the franchise. To play it, you have to use the touchscreen to move to different notes while blowing into the mic. Freaking genius, that's all I gotta say. The music is also entirely original, which is a nice change. I've heard that people hate this flute and find it hard to use, but I didn't really have many problems. But the more I played this game, the more that I wish that it and Phantom Hourglass just used regular button controls. It's pretty crazy how much higher I would rank these otherwise. These DS titles are hindered by a gimmick that works, in quotations, and holds them back for no good reason. There are, of course, a few new items. I really like the sand wand, as it allows you to lift sand into the air. Just like with Phantom Hourglass, the dungeons utilize the touchscreen and items extremely well, making them pretty fun to navigate. The issues always come down to the combat being clunky, but that wasn't all. I noticed points when playing that were hit with slowdown, which surprised me. It didn't happen that often, but this game can chug pretty bad at times. As for the final moments, they're pretty damn crazy and also annoying as hell. Before getting to the end, you have to do this final train section where you can collect force gems, and by pulling the horn, your train goes super fast and you can knock out possessed trains. While this was super fun, at the same time, this drove me crazy. Like, why in the world can't we go this fast in the overworld? But anyway, there's a few different bosses before the final one, and one of them is a literal demon train. What the hell am I looking at here? This is the strangest boss ever. I'm literally fighting an evil train that's shooting lasers at me. How someone can come up with this is beyond me, and I love it. And the Demon King boss, while really cool in design, is super painful to fight. Trying to time the sword slashes to keep Zelda alive can be a problem. It always seemed like I was slashing too late. It's almost like this problem could be completely remedied with the buttons that are available on the Nintendo DS console of Nintendo Systems. I don't know, maybe. Maybe that fix it? But I also really love how Zelda actually helps you deal the final blows at the end, and even with the final sword thrust into the Demon King's head. And like with Phantom Hourglass, Spirit Tracks has its own battle mode, and it's completely different. This time, you're simply trying to collect as many gems as possible. This one has some items, as well as phantoms walking around as obstacles, and was way more frantic than Phantom Hourglass's battle mode. I found this to be pretty fun, and honestly, both battle modes could easily be played for a couple of hours before getting stale. And that's it for the DS games. I'm kinda glad to also be done with these. While I definitely enjoyed parts of both these games, they could also be quite a slog because of the controls. If they ever get remade, they would be so much better with just some buttons and a joystick, that's all I'm saying. But hey, I'll always appreciate just how different these games are compared to most Zelda titles. 17. The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword Man, do I have a lot to say. This was the peak Wii era. Nintendo just had to make an entire Zelda game where it actually felt like you were swinging your sword. Yeah! Because we all totally did that instead of waggling the remote around like an idiot. I guess the first thing I want to talk about is the art style. I've seen a lot of people say this is a blend of Wind Waker and Twilight Princess. Honestly, I don't really see it. It's pretty much just Twilight Princess again, but they turned on some colors and added some vibrance. I'm not a huge fan of how the game looks, but it's serviceable for what it is. But, jeez, some of these character designs are just rough to go back to. The lips in particular on everybody are almost too accentuated and just look off. 
and my god, this game takes forever to get started. There is so much story and tutorials that are thrown at you right at the beginning. I mean, literally, you have to play for like two to three hours before finally getting to a dungeon and aren't constantly getting stopped. The tutorialization was bad in Twilight Princess, but Skyward Sword takes it to a whole nother level. And it doesn't help that you can't get through the text fast. All you can do is sometimes speed it up a little bit and that's it. And on top of that, you can't skip the cutscenes and the game runs at 30 FPS. A lower frame rate isn't that big of a deal, but it makes the slogginess of the beginning feel even longer when the game runs slower. For Age of Calamity, I didn't mind the frame rate because the levels are bite sized and you can get into it very quickly, but Skyward Sword is completely different and way slower, which is why the frame rate is more painful to sit through. And don't even get me started on Fi. She has to be one of the worst side characters ever. She is constantly interrupting you and holding your hand throughout the entire game. Now, the question of the hour is all about the controls. Have they aged well and does swinging with the remote still work? Honestly, I thought it was perfectly functional. You can swing your sword in multiple directions and even do things like spin attacks by pairing motions with the nunchuck. What does suck though, is if you want to move the camera freely, you have to push C and then move the remote around. Yeah, you know what, no thanks, I won't even bother. So while the controls do work, imagine doing this for 30 to 40 hours. Because of course, this just had to be one of the longest Zelda games in the entire franchise. So constantly waggling and swinging your remote around is going to bring on fatigue very quickly. With all that said, the combat can be very fun and clever. Oftentimes, enemies need to be sliced at specific angles. While this is super awkward at first, as opposed to just pushing a button, it is kind of satisfying taking out the bigger enemies and bosses with more complex patterns. The controls don't work 100% of the time, but when you get a flow going, the combat can be great fun. And the music, dude. Nintendo almost always hits with Zelda music, and they really killed it with this one. My copy of the game comes with a music CD. That's how you know Nintendo was extremely confident with the soundtrack. Most pieces are very grand and empowering, but also know when to keep things at ease. Flying around in the sky is paired with an epic instrumental beat that really kicks your senses into overdrive. It almost has a Star Wars kind of vibe to it. It's one of my favorite Zelda songs now. It's simply incredible stuff. And even places like Skyloft have music that's very inviting and just makes you feel like you're at home. Skyloft is well designed too. This hub isn't too big and each area is distinct enough and you'll quickly learn where everything is by heart. And that's not the only thing well designed, because every area is fantastic, dynamic, and filled with clever level design and puzzles. Would you believe me if I told you that almost every area in Skyward Sword is a dungeon? The way the game runs is incredibly linear, which is exactly why Breath of the Wild is the polar opposite, because people gave this game a lot of flack for that. There's some good and bad sides to making a Zelda game as linear as this one. To start with the good, the areas before the dungeons are also designed like mini dungeons, which means that you're basically playing tons of dungeons back to back. And this, of course, is usually Zelda's strong suit, really strong and cleverly designed dungeons. And my god, there are so many fantastic ones in this game. It's hard to pick a favorite, but I really enjoyed the dungeons that were in Lanayru. It's held in this desert, but you interact with these time-shifting cubes that create areas that take place in the past. This idea is f***ing awesome. It brings enemies that are currently dead back to life for you to fight. There's even this section where you have to bring this time cube over a desert that used to be water, and it's the trippiest thing ever. I love this area. These dungeons are fantastic, and I haven't even talked about the items yet. I actually can't believe how awesome these items are. The new ones like the beetle and gust bellows are some of the all time best. Although admittedly, the bomb is a bit awkward to use at first. But hey, you can literally just pick up bomb flowers and add them to your storage, which literally makes no sense at all. Like here, we've got this bomb that's uh, lit up. Let's, oh yeah, let's just throw it in a bag of bombs. Great idea. But I honestly wish it was like this in all the games. And not only are the items fantastic, but they're utilized all the time. There are so many Zelda games that'll heavily use one item for one dungeon, and then you'll never touch it again. That's not the case in Skyward Sword. You'll be using all the items in tons of different scenarios. It makes them feel so much more valuable. For the first time, you can also upgrade your items, which isn't necessary, but it makes some bosses and items a little more convenient. I'm a big fan of upgrading systems regardless, but it got me thinking. You can upgrade everything except your stamina. After all this time, Link doesn't improve his cardio? I don't know, it's just kind of odd, but it wasn't that big of a deal. Heck, I even like that the boss key is turned into a little spinning puzzle as well. And then the bosses. Oh my god, these are great too. A couple of them are irritating to fight, but the way they were designed are so intimidating and breathtaking. The Imprisoned is incredible. It's this huge-ass spiky whale dude that's gonna f*** 
shit up if you don't stab away at its toes. And look at this Levias fight. We're on a huge whale and fighting a parasite that's trapped inside of it while flying around inside of a thunderstorm. This is insane. The best boss by far, however, is Girahim. He's so flashy and goofy. His monologues paired with his looks are simply charming. I'd love to see Girahim in more Zelda games, but I doubt that'll happen. And can we talk about Demise for a second? Bro is literally just Ganondorf if he was in Tekken. Like, yeah, it's technically not Ganon, but come on, just look at the guy. So look, all of this is amazing stuff, but honestly, it's a bit much. I really wish that the areas before the dungeons were more open-ended and included more exploring, because I found myself tired of going to dungeons by the end despite how well they were made. There's a big reason why Skyward Sword drags by the end, too. So the first third of the game has you go to a forest, desert, and volcano. When that's done, you have to go back to each a second time. You'll do these Silent Realm sections, which is literally the same as collecting tears from Twilight Princess, but it's a bit more stealthy now, and you have to try not to be seen. And on top of that, you get brand new dungeons in each of these three areas. So the revisits are still great and it's mostly all new content. But then the last third of the game could have honestly been cut out because you go back to all three areas yet again. Now, granted, you're still doing something different and unique in each place, which is appreciated, but holy crap, this is so redundant. I would have preferred this last third was cut out entirely or at least trimmed down a lot more. I don't think these revisits ruin Skyward Sword or anything, but by the end, you can really feel the slogginess. I do want to quickly touch on the story too. It's the same usual plot, but now there's more of an emphasis on Link and Zelda's relationship. I honestly really enjoyed this. It made me feel a lot more connected to both characters than I typically would. And then adding in Groose as the third wheel was the best. I could see this being a lot of people's favorite Zelda character. He goes from bullying Link to slowly admitting his faults and eventually helping him fight at the end. That's what you call true character development. We stand for Groose. So yeah, Skyward Sword is really quite the conundrum. What we have here is an incredibly polished Zelda title that's almost completely ruined by the control scheme. The reason it's so low on this list is because I can't really recommend playing this on the Wii. Even the biggest motion control fans have to admit that waggling the controller gets tiring after a while. 16. The Legend of Zelda Four Swords Adventures This box art is so badass. I've always loved seeing all the links square up against all these baddies. So this game is really bizarre. It's one of the strangest but quirkiest Zelda games out there. You can play the entire thing on your own or with multiple people. The idea is that when playing with others, each person controls their own Link. You'd have to use multiple Game Boy Advances, as well as this cable to be plugged into the GameCube. I can't imagine that many people actually did this even 20 years ago, but it's really neat that this was the setup. Even playing solo, it's surprisingly easy to control all four Links at once. At first, I was guessing it would feel really clunky trying to move around and to cooperate, but that's not the case at all. You can easily maneuver each character by switching through four different formations on the fly. Each formation can help with combat, lift heavy objects, or step on a series of switches to make progress. But not only that, you can easily switch to controlling just one Link at a time to solve a puzzle that requires more than one screen. So with all that said, the controls are flawless, and I'm still kind of shocked about that. As for the graphics, this is the weirdest mishmash of reused assets I've ever seen. We've got locations and music from A Link to the Past, Link sprites come from the Minish Cap, and the UI, sound effect, and some visual effects come from the Wind Waker. It makes for a game that doesn't have much of its own identity, but I also kind of love it. This almost feels like some strange fan game that's officially released by Nintendo. It's got a lot of charm mixing all these elements together like this. As for the gameplay, it's very different as well. The goal is to get to the end of each level. Each area is actually structured with a traditional world map like it's a platformer or something. You also have to collect 2,000 Force Gems to not only power up, but also simply be allowed to finish the level. Oh, I guess that's another thing. The Force Gems, those are coming from the DS Zelda games. That's just another strangely reused asset. So while the levels have Zelda-like puzzles, they've been dumbed down quite a bit since the multiplayer aspect kind of forces the game to be like that. You can also only hold one item at a time, which is super bizarre, but it also made for some clever puzzles here and there. Since we can't hold items, we also can't hold things like keys. When you find a key or some other important objects, you just run around with it until you get to where you need to go. You can also find hard containers as usual, but they reset after each level. So this really is more of an action puzzle game than an adventure one. Like I said, it's just quirky, and really funny listening to four links at the same time all out, yahoo ha yah! 
and oh my god, the horse riding is amazing. You're completely invincible. Like, dude, why can't every Zelda game have horse riding feel this great? And oh my goodness, I can't help but crack up when the big bomb is on screen and the game is all just like, escape to the Game Boy Advance, which just means to hide in a cave or something, but it's just, it's just funny text. I just like to imagine a scenario where some dude's robbing my house and my only saving grace is to grab my Game Boy Advance and just hide inside of it. Although I have to admit, I'm disappointed that Vadi wasn't the actual final boss. Because of course, Ganon just had to take the spotlight, when it would have been cool to have someone new. But oh well, this is a neat little game that unfortunately by the end gets a little dull. Since the items and levels are so standardized and kind of work the same, it does feel a bit like you're just doing the same stuff over and over. It's also worth mentioning that there's a multiplayer mode called Shadow Battle that requires multiple people and multiple GBAs. It's basically just a battle free-for-all. You'll fight other links with your sword or items that randomly spawn. There's a bit of variety with the maps, enemies, and there's an entire level that plays in the side-scrolling point of view. The main gimmick is you go back and forth between playing on the main screen to your Game Boy screen, which is pretty neat. It's probably not worth the effort to actually play the multiplayer, but it's a nice inclusion nonetheless. So even though this game is smaller in scope compared to the DS titles or Skyward Sword, I'd rather go back to this one simply because of the better control scheme. 15. The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword HD If there was ever a Nintendo game that needed a remake, it was this one. And by golly, it's so much more playable than the original version. The controls are really interesting this time around. You can of course still use motion controls if you want with the Joy-Cons, but that's something I didn't even bother with after my experience with the original. So I stuck with good old sticks and buttons. And while it's better, it's not perfect. Swinging the sword is still a little awkward, because you use the right stick to swing in all the different directions. Stabbing is done by pushing down on the right stick, and you need joystick combinations for the more complex moves. In Skyward Sword's nature, the controls literally have to be like this because directional sword swings are a vital component to the gameplay. It definitely works more consistently than a Wiimote, but I did find there was slightly more lag with attacking, which threw me off sometimes. Something I really don't like is the free camera. It was bad in Skyward Sword, and it's just as janky in this HD remake. Since the right stick is used for the sword normally, you have to hold L to move the camera around with the same stick. This was one of the hardest things to wrap my head around. It was so easy to pull out the sword by accident when I was just trying to adjust the camera. And on top of that, you can't run and turn the camera at the same time. Even with buttons, this is still one of the clunkiest sword controls I've had for any Zelda game. But hey, it is something you can adjust to, and is still so much better than before. I'll gladly put up with it considering the game runs at a full 60 FPS and had the visuals cleaned up a bit. This changes wonders to the gameplay. Finally, I don't feel like I'm playing in slow motion. You can even skip the cutscenes, and Fi also pops up significantly less than before. Nintendo really took the poor pacing to heart and tried to make as many quality of life updates as they could, and I genuinely appreciate that. One of the most controversial changes has to do with the Skylopt amiibo. This doesn't just scan in a heart or rupees once a day, oh no, it's more than that. This amiibo lets you return to the sky at any point. While I personally didn't bother to use the amiibo, this would definitely save you time instead of having to find the nearest statue whenever you needed to travel from the surface to the sky. Why on earth isn't this just in the game normally? Again, I didn't find much reason to actually use the amiibo to take advantage of this, but this future really shouldn't have been locked behind what's essentially a paywall. But who cares? The HD remake finally makes Skyward Sword shine like it always deserved to. It's fantastic dungeons, items, and bosses are all here of course, and it just felt awesome playing with a normal controller at a stable frame rate. There's really no reason at all to play the original over this one. It's completely replaced it. 14. The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess I still remember how excited people were about Twilight Princess when this came out back in the day. People were freaking out about it. Finally, a realistic looking Zelda game! Well, okay, realistic in, let's say, 2006. Nowadays, it looks pretty muddy, and I don't really see many people talk about Twilight Princess anymore. This is one of the two Zelda games with dual releases. We've got the GameCube and Wii version. The big difference on the Wii is that the entire world is mirrored, and of course there's motion controls. But what makes this Zelda title so unique? Well, it's probably the biggest and longest linear game in the series. It's gonna take you a solid 40 to 50 hours to get through this one. It's a big boy. 
And while that might sound awesome, Twilight Princess really could have been consolidated down to 20 to 30 hours. The beginning is so freaking slow. It takes like an hour to get through the tutorial. And at first, you can't switch from human to wolf link on the fly. Story-wise, it makes sense why you have to play through half the game before you can switch automatically, but man, does it slow the pacing to a crawl. The biggest advantage to wolf link is the fact that he can warp around the entire map. You'll only play as wolf link when you're in the twilight sections, so most of the time you have to get around his link, who's way slower. Of course you can use Epona, but you have to be near some grass to even call Epona, and even then it takes a while to get anywhere. And Hyrule Field is obnoxiously big. Just remember how empty Hyrule Field is in Ocarina of Time? Yeah, remember that? Multiply it by six. Now of course, there are hidden heart pieces and caves to find, which do fill things out a bit better than whatever Ocarina of Time did, but it still feels kind of lifeless. But you may have noticed that this game is fairly high up on the list, because it gets really good about halfway in. Which is really unfortunate that you have to play like 20 hours before the game's pacing feels fixed, but it's honestly worth it if you already like Zelda games. The combat feels super smooth this time around. Swords play is really satisfying, and lots of enemies require a few different tactics to take them out. This makes the combat feel really fresh overall. Playing as a dog does feel pretty silly, but I thought it was kind of fun. You only have two attacks as the Doge, and you can also hold B to make this dark circle thing, which wipes out everything around you. Combat with the wolf comes down to locking in and mashing the attack button, so it's pretty basic, but that's not really a problem. The game of the game might say Zelda, and you might be playing as Link, but honestly, neither of them matter. This is Midna's game. She controls everything you do and is the reason the story progresses. At first, she uses Link to help save her world, but then realizes that she needs to help Link's world as well. Midna is a really fun character. She's a little bit witty and has some adorable gibberish. I can understand why people like Midna now. She's probably the most useful quote-unquote side character we've ever gotten. Like most Zelda games, there's a ton of collectibles like pieces of hearts and rupees, but this game has a ton of extra stuff to find. I really only found the bugs worth getting so I could upgrade my wallet, but things like the post souls don't really have much of a worthy reward. So as usual, the collectibles are optional depending on how much fun you're having exploring. The rupee currency does get pretty broken by the end of the game, but I think it's like that for most Zelda games. As you'd expect, there's an ocarina mechanic, and it sucks this time. To make music, you have to howl with Wolf Link. And at first, I thought this was incredibly stupid and hilarious, but the farther I got into the game, the more annoying it became. Now obviously, it serves a great purpose, you learn new moves by mimicking the Howling Stones, but the patterns require you to be really precise, and for some reason I was struggling with this. But hey, maybe this is just my aging brain. An actual skill issue may have been playing a factor here, but I didn't have issues with the other instruments, so I don't know what was the problem with this one. Easily the highlight, however, is the dungeons. There's nine in this game. While not as many as Skyward Sword, that's a crazy amount still, and most of them are really fun. Whether you're spinning on the walls in Arbiter's Grounds, climbing the ceiling in the Goron Mines, or double hookshotting your way around the Sky City, you're bound to have a great time with these. The puzzles are usually simple, but still feel great to figure out. And the bosses, oh man, these bosses are awesome too. Especially Argorok. You fight this badass dragon by hooking your way up some pillars. Then you gotta swing around him on these pea hat things, hook him to the dragon's back, slash it a bunch of times, and send him to the mother ground as a final finishing move! It's so sick! There's lots of badass moments with these bosses. And also, Skull Kid randomly shows up. I mean, uh, sure? It's a welcome cameo. It just feels strange to see him show up for a minute. And honestly, same with Ganondorf. Zant really could have been the ultimate boss for this game, but for some reason, Ganon sneaks in at the last minute. Which is fine, I guess. The final boss is still really good, but they had something cooking with Zant, and they should have just stuck with him. The last thing I'm going to bring up is the ending. Midna becomes humanish again, and I find it hilarious how she's just like, oh yeah, I'm so hot, aren't I? And the credits just roll immediately afterwards. I just found it very amusing for Zelda to end like that. So overall, it's a really solid game that should have trimmed out like 10 to 20 hours because it can feel very bloated at times. And if you want difficulty, you're not going to find it here as difficulty progression is almost non-existent throughout the entire game. But those dungeons, man, they are genuinely some of the best in the entire series. 13. The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess HD It's the same game again, but with a bunch of notable improvements. Obviously, the graphics look a lot better and aren't as grainy compared to the GameCube or Wii, but if I'm being truthful, it's not that much better. This is more of a graphical upscale than a remake, which I feel like the game kind of needed. It still looks a bit muddy and weird, but it's not that big of a deal. The gamepad actually has quite a bit of solid features. The item navigation is entirely on the gamepad now, so swapping items is seamless. Once you can switch between Wolf and Human Link, there's a button on the gamepad that 
does it automatically, which is a very welcome quality of life update. You can also collect Miiverse stamps, as if this game needed more collectibles, although it's not really anything new. Some chests that had other goodies before now just have the stamps. And as we all know, Miiverse doesn't work anymore anyway, so they're completely useless unless you really want 100% completion. There's a couple other things too, like larger wallets and the Ghost Lantern items, and the last thing is the Amiibo. There's actually quite a bit going on here, but we'll start with the basics. You can replenish health and arrows with the Link and Zelda Amiibo, but scanning Ganondorf adds a hero mode and makes the game way harder. While that's cool, it's pretty dumb that it's tied behind an amiibo. But then there's the Wolf Link amiibo, which unlocks the Cave of Shadows. It's the same idea as the Cave of Ordeals, but you can only be Wolf Link the entire time. So if you like Twilight Princess and want something a bit harder, then this remake is right up your alley. 12. The Legend of Zelda Echoes of Wisdom It has been literal decades since getting a Zelda game where you actually play as Zelda. Right away, we can see that the graphics from the A Link's Awakening remake are used here, which I think is a pretty smart move. Generally speaking, for each console generation, Nintendo will reuse art styles, so it makes a lot of sense why that logic has been applied here. Immediately, the game just begins, and then takes an almost Metroid approach. You have full hearts and all your weapons, which is very different from every other Zelda game. But that's not the only thing that's different. This is actually one of the strangest titles in the entire franchise. Instead of using a sword, arrows, or your usual items to attack, you instead create echoes. Echoes can be anything from a bed to a rock or even your average enemy. It's pretty surprising how many things can be turned into echoes. There's quite a bit of variety, and their usefulness can vary a lot too, whether it comes down to combat, blocking, or just fighting off enemies. It feels very bizarre to not use a sword at all times, which I'm honestly kind of conflicted about. The farther I got into the game, the more I found myself using the same handful of echoes over and over again. And man, there were definitely moments that had a bunch of tough enemies on screen, and I desperately wanted to just whip out the sword and go ham, but the reason I didn't do that most of the time is because you do get a sword, but only for an extremely short duration. You can only charge it by finding energy speckles, so while the echoes are a really unique way of going on the adventure, it also slows things down a lot. And unfortunately, the AI with the enemy echoes could be really stupid sometimes. I found echoes taking forever to attack, or just completely missing their targets for no reason. To select an echo, you have to pull up a quick menu menu and literally scroll through dozens and dozens of options. You can technically organize the echoes by last used and other certain categories, but it's such a pain in the ass. The one thing that would have fixed this problem is just giving us the option to pull up a favorites menu instead. I don't know, maybe have us pick between like four or five echoes, and then if we want to swap an echo out in our favorites list, you just pause the game normally and do that. This is a really fascinating problem to me because this was a huge complaint with Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. While it isn't as big of a deal in this game because it only takes 15 to 20 hours to beat compared to over 100 hours with those other games, it's still annoying having to scroll through this huge menu. I have faith that Nintendo will tweak this in the future, but that's my thoughts on the echoes. This seems like one of those games that, down the line, people are going to spies because of how slow paced it is. And that's really frustrating because traditional dungeons finally make a return and they're freaking awesome. The puzzles are really well thought out and let you come up with your own methods on getting through them with all the echoes. This is where the game truly shines, is in its dungeons and even bosses. While the bosses are incredibly easy, they're all a blast to play and some of them are super obscure callbacks. Like Smog as an example is a remake from Oracle of Ages. Like, what? That's so random, but I kind of love that. And dude, you can finally warp inside dungeons again. This was possible in The Wind Waker, but it's been expanded a little bit better in this game. As for the controls, it feels pretty good to move around. Actually, it feels great. Zelda has this little spin move that gives you a little burst of speed, so it's satisfying to chain those together. It kind of reminds me a lot of how spinning worked with the Deku scrub in Majora's Mask. Like, seriously, there's no way they didn't draw inspiration from that. And on top of that, you can bind stuff just like in Tears of the Kingdom. There's also crafting, and it's fairly similar to Breath of the Wild. You find a bunch of food or minerals, and you can mix those together into a smoothie. This makes health almost worthless, considering you can carry a ton of smoothies and basically set yourself up to never lose. Stamp stations are back, by the way, as if anyone remembered that those actually came from the DS Zelda games. That's a funny thing about Echoes of Wisdom. There are callbacks to virtually every Zelda game you can think of. The highlight of this game by far are all of the rift sections. This is basically the plot of the game. These rifts are made from an evil source, and they suck in people only to make evil clones. Yeah, this sounds a lot like the plot of the Subspace Emissary, and that's sick. 
Going through these rift sections is a lot of fun. The levels are more platform based and really make you experiment with all your echoes. The chilling atmosphere is what sells it so well. It's so different from most Zelda areas. There are a couple of things I wasn't a fan of though, one of those being the frame rate. The Link's Awakening remake experienced frame drops, but this game is so much worse. Instead of locking in a solid 30 FPS, it jumps all over the place. You'll go from 60 frames to 15 in an instant, and it's almost distracting at times. And this might be a hot take, but I really didn't care that much for the music. Like, it's not bad or anything, but I found it to be kind of boring. Now, of course, each piece fits well with each world with its calmer cadence, but that's just not really for me. I'm used to hearing epic orchestral scores, so it just felt strange that the music was so laid back. If anything to be said, is that Echoes of Wisdom is a shining example of why I love Nintendo games. Nintendo is never afraid to try something new, even if they don't stick the landing perfectly. Throwing shit at a wall only helps them create better games in the long run from trying out all these new concepts, so that's why I'm okay with this game being so odd. It's still an incredible Zelda game, but definitely not one of my all-time favorites. 11. The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past The absolute glow-up this game received compared to Zelda 2 is just bonkers. A Link to the Past cemented what it takes to be a great Zelda game, and even to this day is a ton of fun. To start, the pixel art is just incredible. It's aged quite wonderfully, and so many of the characters are filled with creativity and expressiveness. The music also does a great job setting the tone. It's all the usual tunes we hear time and time again in the modern games, but a lot of the best Zelda music comes from this title. When the dungeon music hits, or when first entering the dark world, the music makes the moment feel powerful and exhilarating. When it comes to the gameplay, it feels so much better to run through. The items are also just great fun, whether that comes to the arrow, hookshot, bombs, and so on. There's actually quite a bit of variety to pick from. Heck, the power glove is a dedicated upgrade. When it comes to the dungeons, the puzzles are generally not too cryptic until the end, but there's still moments where it's almost impossible to know what to do without looking at a guide. But one of the biggest upgrades by far are the bosses. They're all really fun to fight, have interesting patterns, and some of them have hidden weak spots that you can only figure out by messing around with your inventory. Heck, there's even fast traveling, which is a godsend because the overworld is fairly large for a SNES game. I mean, it's not massive by today's standards, but using the flute to get around is handy. I just wish we had access to this a bit earlier in the game. The only thing I didn't like about A Link to the Past is, well, the combat again. I feel like a broken record saying this, but it really goes to show just how important it is to get these core mechanics right. Since we can move in more directions, it's much easier to aim sword slashes and whatnot, but the way that Link swings still feels a little awkward. Since he swings in one direction at a top-down point of view, it means you have to be very specific with where Link is placed to hit an enemy. But honestly, I'd boil this down to me just being bad at top-down Zelda games in general. I don't think this is a problem most people have, but yeah, I honestly can't believe how well this game has aged. There's so many dungeons to tackle, tons of secrets, dying spawns you in much more forgiving areas. It's a game that every Zelda fan should play. You've probably already played it if you're this far in the video, but if you haven't, what are you waiting for? 10. The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past and Four Swords. I love how the title is on the screen for like three seconds, and then it just immediately takes us to the file select. A Link to the Past gets a remake on the Game Boy Advance and is also bundled with Four Swords. Before getting to the new mode, we'll start with the main game. This is one of those few Zelda games that I never hear get brought up in conversation. It is almost a one-to-one -one remake of the SNES classic, but there are a few changes that I feel make this version a bit better. For one, the pixel art and general brightness has improved a bit. The colors just look a bit cleaner. Even things like the font of the text are a bit easier on the eyes. Link also talks a lot in this game. Every time you jump or do a sword slash, you hear, hot, hoot, hit, hoot, scat, hoot, yat. Some people might find this annoying. I personally love it when Mario or Link talk like they're a Pokemon. I just think it's super funny. That's why I love the advanced remake so much. Listening to Mario talk every two seconds is, is just like, I don't know, this makes me all happy inside. The save system is also much more forgiving. Dying gives you an option to spawn from wherever room you last entered. And the items are a bit more useful as well. Things like the Master Sword can break pots and skulls now, and the hammer and arrows are a bit more versatile too. But as for the downsides, well, the music is a bit compressed. Which, of course, isn't surprising. GBA games had their limits with the audio hardware, we all know this. But I still feel like it sounds nice enough to where it doesn't really bother me. The game is also a bit more zoomed in compared to the SNES version, but it doesn't really hinder the game at all. It's not anywhere near as bad as something like Sonic the Hedgehog on GBA or Super Mario Bros. Deluxe. I think more people should give this version of A Link to the Past a try. It's like a slightly better version of the original. But what about Four Swords? Honestly, this was shockingly fun to run through. Each player controls a different Link, and you go through tutorial stages in four levels. The items come from a variety of Zelda titles, and I was surprised to see the Magnet from Oracle of Seasons make a return of all things. 
things. You basically just work together to solve puzzles and fight the bosses, so it's pretty much a downscaled version of Four Swords Adventures. Your experience is going to vary depending on who you play with, but for me, this was a really enjoyable two-hour romp. Although I do have to admit that the music was a bit wonky, it didn't feel Zelda-esque at all. But for what it's worth, it's a fun little mode if you have a group of friends to play it with. So because of the addition of Four Swords, I'd say this is slightly better than the SNES original. 9. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time Master Quest I wasn't exactly sure how to rank this seeing as it has two different versions. The original, which was supposed to come out on the failed N64 disc drive, ended up getting its first release on the GameCube as a two-game bonus disc. Not to be confused with the Collector's Edition, which also has Ocarina of Time. But there's also a version of Master Quest through Ocarina of Time 3D. The main thing to know is that both versions have redesigned dungeons, which I say in quotations. On the GameCube, that's the only major change. While on the 3DS, you of course get these Master Quest dungeons, plus the entire world is mirrored, and you take double the damage. Since these differences are fairly small, I've decided to combine both Master Quest games into their own, but I'll mostly be talking about the 3DS one. Now, some people may prefer Master Quest over the original because of the increased difficulty, but I honestly don't like it when games decide to mirror the entire world. I feel the exact same way about Mario Kart. Like, who the hell wants to play the tracks mirrored? Exactly. Literally nobody ever. As someone that's played OOT a few times, it's extremely disorienting to go through, seeing as my brain has been accustomed to the original layout. For that reason alone, I prefer the original slightly more, which I'll go into more later on. But of course, the increase in difficulty is always appreciated. As for the new dungeons, they're, uh, kind of harder? Yeah, there's surprisingly not much here to highlight. The actual layouts remain mostly the same. The main difference here is that some of the puzzles have been tweaked to be more challenging, and there's more difficult enemies to fight, so you've got a bit more combat in all the dungeons. So all in all, both versions of Master Quest are still Ocarina of Time at its core, but I don't know about you, I'd rather just pop in the original. 8. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time the very first Zelda game I ever completed. There's a good reason why this is regarded as one of the best games of all time. Has it aged magnificently well? For the most part, yes, but it does have some glaring flaws that are worth bringing up. This wasn't just the first 3D Zelda, but one of the first 3D games that actually plays well. Its single saving grace is of course Z-targeting. The ability to automatically focus your attention and aim at enemies was and still is amazing. This makes fights extremely engaging and easy to understand, and the fact that later enemies require precise timing to attack makes this all the better. This, paired with items like the bomb and boomerang, makes exploring the world feel really satisfying. Their usage is really dynamic, as you'll have to aim bombs at specific spots to blow holes in the ground, or fling the boomerang at a spot in the wall to open a door. Although I will admit that the bow and arrow minigames are a bit infuriating because of the outdated controls, thankfully those are optional. The dungeons are a lot of fun to figure out and explore too, especially once you start playing as Adult Link and really have to use your noggin. And the music. Oh my god, the music is simply fantastic. Whether it's Kakariko Village's peaceful serenading home feel, to Hyrule Field's encouraging and exciting score, to Lost World's cheerful yet mysterious tone. And not even just the music is great. The Ocarina itself has melodies that are so memorable that you'll hum them for years to come. This is one of Zelda's most ingenious items for its ability to play catchy music, but also help you solve puzzles, fast travel, and bring out Epona. But by far, one of the best parts of this game is the ending. It is so damn cool, even still. The way that it builds itself up has held up extremely well. You climb up Ganon's castle to fight him one more time, and you think he's defeated, so his castle begins to crumble and it's a race to the bottom to survive. But then, Ganondorf transforms forms into Ganon, and now you have to take him on without the Master Sword. The music here is what really sells it. It's got this dreary yet epic mood that makes you want to fight through what feels like the bottom of hell. Clearly, I think I've made it obvious that I really enjoyed Ocarina of Time, but like I said earlier, it's not without its shortcomings. A lot of people bring up that Navi won't shut up, and while I agree to that to an extent, I never really thought it was enough to bother me. Certainly not as bad as Fi, that's for sure. Even the Water Temple is okay. Like, yeah, switching your boots every 30 seconds is kind of dumb, but the puzzles themselves are still fun to solve. The real issues come down to the hardware limitations and a few oversights. The text speed in particular is very slow and can't be skipped. This isn't that big of a deal at first, but it was really dragging on by the end of the game. Hyrule Field is massive, in fact, maybe a bit too massive. 
Not much really happens here. It just feels like an empty hub world that lets us travel from place to place. The frame rate is pretty low as well, but again, this is on N64, so it's to be expected. And the graphics, ugh, they have not aged well either. A lot of the textures are very muddy and blurry, and the pre-rendered environments are laughably noticeable. When it comes to the collectibles, there's not much that's required here, but the golden sculptures are fun to hunt for, at least to an extent. You can get some rewards for half of them, like a heart piece, which is cool, but if you go for all 100, you only get 200 rupees, which is super useless considering Ocarina of Time is already loaded with rupees. A lot of these shortcomings make it a bit hard to want to replay Ocarina of Time, but lucky for us, there's a better way to experience this masterpiece. One of the main reasons that this was ranked higher than most 3D Zelda games is because it's not filled with bloat. While games like Twilight Princess and Skyward Sword have dungeons that are admittedly better in a lot of ways, the overall gameplay feels much more bloated. Ocarina of Time is the perfect length and is way more replayable for that reason. 7. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time 3D A remake so good that there really isn't a reason to play the original. Just about everything you could ask for has been fixed, or at the very least tweaked. For starters, the game looks much nicer with its better textures and higher quality models. Granted, this is still in the 3DS, but it is a noticeable improvement. The text speed is also a lot faster, which is something I didn't think I'd care about much until actually playing. Getting through the text makes a big difference with the pacing. I felt like I was cruising through without any sort of slogginess. And speaking of speed, the frame rate is much more solid. I noticed a few frame dips when too many rupees were on screen at once, but that almost never happened. You'll be rocking a solid 30 FPS the whole way through. The biggest change, however, is the motion controls. When you're at a standstill or L-targeting, you can move the camera around for extra precision. This feels very strange at first, but is an especially welcome feature considering it makes looking around a lot more intuitive. This also applies to a lot of the items, so aiming with a boomerang or slingshot feels more natural. Then the bottom screen, as you'd expect, is a huge upgrade as well. You can pull up your gear, map, and items at any given time. Swapping things around is so fast, and there's even extra item slots in the touchscreen if you want to utilize them. Even when pulling up the ocarina, you can tap a button to pull up all the music sheets right on the spot. Temples like the water one aren't easier per se, but are more fluid since you can swap boots on the fly without pausing. So while the core gameplay is virtually the same, the improvements make it much more enjoyable. It's really funny how running backwards is still the fastest way to move unironically as well. I'm not sure if that was left in on purpose or not, but I'm glad it's still a thing. There really aren't many drawbacks unless you're a purist at heart. The only thing I wasn't really jiving with isn't even the game's fault. It's the 3DS's joypad. Moving around feels fine, but man is it irksome when my thumb is constantly slipping due to having almost no grip. Don't get me wrong, I like the 3DS, but I am so glad that we've moved on from these types of joysticks. Play this version if for some reason you've never played Ocarina of Time. 6. The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker I've played this game quite a few times, but never got around to finishing it. So boy was I excited to finally have the chance to tackle the entire thing, and it did not disappoint. This honestly might always be one of my favorite linear Zelda games. I mean, damn, it gets so much right that I don't even know where to start. First off, the game's cartoony style is incredible and has aged remarkably well. Which is funny because everyone hated how Wind Waker looked when it was first revealed. The fans were desperate for a gritty, realistic Zelda, and then we got Twilight Princess. And, uh, yeah, even the HD version isn't looking so hot nowadays. But then there's the controls. Holy crap. The animation is incredibly fluid and well done. It plays pretty similar to Ocarina of Time, but it's so much smoother feeling. This is one of those things where you have to actually hold the controller in your hand and just feel how nice moving around and swinging your sword is. And the combat is much better, too. You slash through enemies fast, and the music is dramatic with every hit you deal to an enemy. It really brings this tight sense of impact and adds so much to the combat. And oh man, the locations and music make the world feel so alive. Outset Island is so cozy, paired with its relaxing music, and Rooster Island does such a great job getting you excited for the adventure ahead with its chirpy and upbeat tunes. But the best part by far is the Great Sea. Now obviously, there are a bit of qualms with all the sailing, but I don't even mind because the music is perfect. I've never heard a more adventurous and an intriguing piece of music. It just gets you into the mood to look into the horizons and go explore the islands ahead. And the islands themselves are great too. None of them are that big or too overbearing to explore. They've got just enough goodies for you to find before moving on to the next one, which is something Starfield should have taken notes on, just saying. And it's almost realistic in an ironic sense that way, because if you were to go sailing and find a random island in real life, you'd likely only find a couple interesting things and that's it. 
In fact, some of the islands remind me of Breath of the Wild of all things. You know the ones where you drop into a submarine, battle some enemies, then you get a prize at the end? Yeah, that is the exact concept as a shrine, which really makes me ponder on how much inspiration Wind Waker had on Breath of the Wild. Now in practice, the sailing does drag on a little bit by the end. Having to switch the direction to go faster can be a bit tedious, but it really doesn't matter that much considering you can fast travel about halfway through playing, which almost entirely solves that problem. So despite all the sailing, the game is paced very well, but also very bizarrely for a Zelda game. There's a few mini dungeons at the beginning and midway point, and only two big dungeons at the end. This might be a negative for some, but I think it's perfectly fine. Those last two dungeons feel all the more grand and big because of the build-up to reaching them, and the mini dungeons are really fun in their own right. And you get to to play as this little Makar dude. Look at his little waddle. So precious. Part of the reason the dungeons are so fun is because of the items, which are quite satisfying to use for puzzles and combat. Heck, even the ship that you ride around in uses your items as an anchor for treasure chest or as a cannon with the bombs. It's such a smart way to utilize the items in both scenarios. The only temple I wasn't really a fan of was the Tower of the Gods. You spend a lot of time just waiting for the water to go up and down, but it's not that bad overall. Instead of the ocarina, you use the Wind Waker to travel and change the time of day and stuff like that. It's basically the same thing, but simplified. The characters are also a joy. I love Tetra's sassiness and Beetle yelling, THANK YOU, whenever I buy something from them. Beetle's voice lines are so ingrained in my head now that I always imagine saying thank you exactly like that, but I've never done it in real life, and I probably won't because, I mean, you know, you know what, maybe I should. There's also a lot of extra collectibles to find, as usual. The most prominent being the treasure charts. You don't technically need them to find your way around, but they are necessary to find treasure in the sea, some of which are heart pieces. I wish they weren't necessary, but again, it's just a nitpick. But dude, the ending to this game. Oh my god! You and Zelda take on Ganon at the same time. She shoots a light arrow at your shield, it bounces off and hits Ganon, then you come in and stab him through his f***ing skull! While I've loved the ending Ganon fights in a lot of Zelda games, the Wind Waker just gives you this raw sense of power. It's just so badass and is a perfect conclusion to the Wind Waker. This is by far my favorite linear Zelda title, but there's of course a remake that improved on it quite a bit. Five, The Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom. This is such a weird game to rank on a list, because your perception of it is going to completely depend on if you played Breath of the Wild first. I purposefully played Breath of the Wild early last year, and Tears of the Kingdom a year and a half later so I could give both of these massive games some time to breathe in my mind. And I have to say, I was pleasantly surprised with what Tears of the Kingdom offers, but it also has so many bizarre faults that annoyed the crap out of me. But to start off, Tears of the Kingdom is the official sequel, and boy did it have a rocketed start. Link and Zelda are exploring the depths underneath Hyrule Castle. This immediately sets such a weird tone that most Zelda games don't have. They eventually find a freaky looking corpse, and it suddenly awakens and almost destroys Link's arm entirely. Thankfully, his arm is saved and replaced, and then the best moment happens. Link finds the exit to this mysterious tomb he's in. He jumps out, and all goes silent. The piano creeps itself back in. The orchestration rises, and out of nowhere, the goosebumps come rushing in. What an absolutely phenomenal start to a game. It's another one of those Zelda moments that I'm never going to forget. But oh my god, the rest of the beginning was pain. You only have to do a few shrines, but it's a tedious few hours to slog through. Since you don't get the abilities right away, you constantly get roadblocked by tall walls or running water. You don't even get the paraglider for crying out loud. And this is in the sky section. It'd be nice to not have to wait to get that. I thought I was going to kind of hate this game based on these first few hours, but it starts to pick up once you get down to Hyrule. While the overworld is the same as Breath of the Wild, it does just enough to stand out on its own and kind of feel different. There's a lot of deja vu moments when entering areas I visited from the first game, but it's not that big of a deal. As you'd expect, the graphics are exactly the same. Breath of the Wild still looks beautiful, despite it not being very colorful. This game is a little desaturated for my tastes, but I think it works for the style they're trying to capture. There's moments of slowdown too, and it's more prevalent than it was in Breath of the Wild. 
but again, it never really affected the gameplay to the point of being unplayable, it was just noticeable sometimes. So besides the overworld having a new coat of paint, Link also gets entirely new abilities. For starters, we have the Ultra Hand. This allows Link to carry objects and also build anything that he wants. And I mean anything. You can attach a bunch of stuff together and then use it as a way to clear big gaps or even build vehicles. I didn't get to that point until much later into playing, but I love the idea of Ultra Hand. While it can be a little clunky trying to move things around into specific places, it's a lot of fun to do. With that said, however, Ultra Hand is almost too useful. There's parts in this game, which I'll get to later, where Ultra Hand and Recall completely break the puzzles. And speaking of Recall, this is another really unique ability. By pointing your cursor at any object that moved, you can have it travel back in time for a short period. As you're playing, you'll find a lot of rocks that fall from the ground, so you can stand on these rocks, and with Recall, you'll propel yourself hundreds of feet into the air in a matter of seconds. Then there's the Fuse ability. This allows you to enhance any weapon or shield with other objects around you. This, once again, is an incredibly unique concept, but is honestly executed poorly. To fuse things together, you simply find an object on the ground, and then pick between fusing it with your sword or shield. While this is great in concept, actually using it is very cumbersome. In most circumstances, you're going to pull items from your inventory for fusing. The fastest way to do it is to either pause the game and drop something, or to scroll through this massive menu and spend like 10 seconds trying to find the thing you want. Fusing can also be done with your arrows, but this is also horribly implemented. If you want to keep using the same item over and over again while in combat, you have to manually add that item after every single arrow shot. While it's cool there's so many different options to enhance the arrows, this is obnoxious in practice. And this inventory wheel is awful. Like, did it really have to be one long line? While you can technically sort it in a few different ways, would it have killed them to at least add a favorites option? You know, maybe have like five items set to favorite, and then you just automatically use that item until it runs out. But moving on to the last big ability is Ascend. This one breaks my brain in all the right ways. You'll simply fly through a ceiling and reach the top. I got so used to using Ascend that I started walking around my house, imagining myself using Ascend and trying to pinpoint what would be the fastest route to my room. This one thankfully doesn't really break the game, and I think it's a necessary ability for any future open world Zelda games. It simply makes scaling things vertically so much more enjoyable. Oh, and uh, there's also Auto Build, which basically lets you build stuff much faster. And I honestly didn't use it at all, like I literally just unlocked it right before fighting Ganondorf at the end, so I imagine it'd be more helpful for people that liked building stuff. Speaking of that, let's talk about the building mechanics. So like I said before, Ultra Hand lets you build all kinds of things. You can use fans, wings, rockets, steering controls, and tons of more devices. They're specifically called Zonai devices, and these are found in the wild or in these Zonai dispensers. To use the dispensers, you need Zonai charges, which you get by fighting Zonai enemies. There's no Sheikah enemies or guardians this time. Instead, you have these robot things, which are basically the exact same concept. But anyway, you get the Zonai charges from them and can hold on to tons of different devices to be able to drive or fly around the world. To power them, you have to use a battery. The only problem with this is that the battery you start with sucks. The battery drains so fast that it's hardly worth building anything for quite a while. We'll talk about upgrading the battery in a bit, but once you do eventually upgrade it, the Sky Islands are much more enjoyable to explore. Flying around is a ton of fun, and the game allows you to be super creative with the vehicles you build. The only issue with that is there's literally no incentive to ever be creative with your builds. That's because your vehicle disappears if you're too far away from it, and it takes up a ton of resources. Creating a stockpile of Zonai devices is no quick feat, so there's no incentive to build anything too crazy beyond just going from point A to B. So while building stuff is cool, I'd be completely okay with it just not being in the next Zelda game. Or at the very least, it should be scaled down and maybe only used for a dungeon or something. I guess we should get to the dungeons. Boy oh boy the dungeons. For starters, actually reaching the dungeons is kind of the best part. Each area has much more of a build-up to them. So for the wind dungeon, you have to bounce off these flying boat sails and soar through the air. For the water dungeon, it requires you to make this gaping water hole, then you go inside it to eventually open up a waterfall which you'll eventually swim up. The build up to reach each of these dungeons is really creative and enjoyable to do, and that's where the fun stops. 
We were actually told that the dungeons would feel like dungeons again, since that was a huge complaint from Breath of the Wild. And, uh, yeah, I have no idea what Nintendo's talking about. All four of these dungeons feel exactly the same again. There's multiple ways to solve the so-called puzzles, and it's very easy to complete them all. I enjoyed the Fire Temple the best, as it felt the most like a classic dungeon, but at the same time, it was pretty tedious having to get around in the minecarts. But I will give them some credits, because the bosses are much, much better now. Marbled Goma is so creepy, crawling around on the ceiling. Mukturok swiftly swims through gobs of mud. Queen Gibdo creates these massive tornadoes while flying around. And Kolgira has you firing arrows mid-flight at his weak spots. Even C's construct was pretty neat, which is technically the fifth as well as secret temple of the game. You'll use a sage and ride it like a robot while slapping the construct around with arrows or spiky hands. Oh, and uh, while we're here, I might as well talk about the sages real quick. These are also different from Breath of the Wild, and I really don't care for most of them. Tulin is the only one worth using. Instead of using Rivali's Gust of Wind to shoot you up into the air, Tulin will shoot you forward. Now, at first, I was really missing the ability to quickly gain height from anywhere until I realized how much easier it is to move vertically in this game, so this stage actually ended up being great. Then there's Yunabo. He can curl up into a ball and be launched forward as an attack. So while it's cool, I didn't find him to be that useful. Sidon is kind of the same deal. You can give yourself a temporary water shield or swing your sword to slash out some water. It was really only helpful for the dungeon boss fight, and that's it. Riju creates this circle of electricity, which allows you to shoot arrows that will electrify any enemies in the circle. I really don't get the point of this stage, considering we can use quite a few items that have the exact same effect. And then for the final stage, this is Minero, who I've already talked about briefly, this is by far the worst of them all, and it really shouldn't be. You control a mech that can merge Zonai devices with both of your arms and even your back. <laughs> that sounds incredible, right? Yeah, I wish it was, but there's two huge problems. For one, you can't jump. Like, yes, I'm serious, you actually can't jump. And two, the controls are super clunky and not fun to move around in. You can technically remedy the jumping problem by adding a rocket or something to Monero's back, but that's so much effort for what should be a basic function. The most bizarre thing about all these sages is that they aren't integrated into your moveset. Instead, they follow around as spirits, and you have to walk up to them to use their ability. Are you kidding me? This is so stupid! In fact, I had all the sages turned off for half the game because they're just not that helpful and they ended up getting in the way. The only one that stuck around was Tulin, and even he got in the way sometimes. If I was collecting stuff on the ground, sometimes I would activate Tulin's Gust of Wind by accident, which is precisely why it makes no sense for the sages to not be integrated into the move pool. And to think I haven't even talked about the shrines yet. Dude, there is so much to talk about in this game. The shrines are very similar to before. There are many puzzles that take a few minutes to complete. Thankfully, they've all been moved to different locations in Hyrule, and there's also a bunch of them on the Sky Islands. Unfortunately, the shrines never really get difficult. Breath of the Wild shrines were also easy to complete, but by the end of that game, there was a noticeable difficulty spike. That doesn't happen in Tears of the Kingdom. The puzzles are almost always simple to solve, and sometimes you don't even have to solve the puzzle. If you need to move, say, some sort of big object, you can usually cheese it by using Ultra Hand to lift it into the air and then grab it with Recall. Ultra Hand and Recall as a team do a great job destroying lots of puzzles in Tears of the Kingdom, if you really want them to. But look, at the end of the day, the shrines are still fun to find and do, but I wish they utilized the abilities in more complex ways. Now, I know I've spent quite a lot of time talking down on this game, but even still, Tears of the Kingdom is an incredible experience. Exploring the world at your own pace and discovering new areas is still magical, just like it was in Breath of the Wild. While I wish the Sky Islands were a lot bigger, it's a lot of fun to see what's in all those places too. There's also a handful of new enemies, which is nice, and then there's the depths. Oh my god, this new area is f***ing awesome. When you first dive into one of these pits, you're shrouded in darkness, and then you're hit with this. The music choice, oh my god, it's perfect. 
I've never felt more intimidated and unwelcome in a video game. The Depths is essentially the Hyrule map, but completely inverted. So the lakes are now the high points, while the mountains are the low points. Some may say this is a lazy way of adding more content. I think it's ingenious because inverting the map is so radically different to what we're used to. It feels like an entirely new world. Instead of finding shrines down here, you'll look for light routes which light up small chunks of the world. It's really satisfying trying to find your way through the dark and spotting a light route out in the distance. And while you're down here, there's tougher enemies and mid-bosses that give you different drops compared to the surface. The main one you want to find are the Zonites, and this has to do with the batteries. See, I told you I'd bring this up later. You can take these Zonites and turn them into crystallized charges. These charges can then be brought back up to the surface and be used to upgrade your battery. So it's basically a three-way cycle to upgrade your batteries. While this takes an extremely long time to do, it's mindless fun to explore the depths and be rewarded for fighting the harder mini-bosses. And oh my god, the gloom hands? Gotta bring that up for a second, those things are freaky. The first time I saw them, the music gets all distorted, and then the hands just immediately reach you, you die in like 5 seconds, and dude, I've never been so taken aback by a video game. But also down in the depths are Poe's, and these can be exchanged for items and extra armor. The depths are probably my favorite new aspect of the game. I didn't even find every light route, but I spent dozens and dozens of hours having a blast looking around for them. While the light routes are directly beneath the shrines up above, actually reaching them is not the same process because of the inverted map. But yeah, I think that's really the main gist of what Tears of the Kingdom has to offer. But there are a few other small things I want to bring up. Firstly, I was really missing my remote bombs. It kind of sucks that you have to use bomb flowers to blow up the rocks. Or, well, okay, I guess you could technically use the fire sage, but I kind of forgot he existed. So I was just using the bomb flowers, and they're a bit scarce to find. There's also new caves and wells in the overworld, and I'm guessing these were added in to simply find new places to put the shrines, and they're pretty neat additions. A lot of the caves have different ways of traversing them, so I didn't feel like I was repeating the same thing each time I went in one. And the wells are basically the same idea as a cave, but on a smaller scale. Another complaint people had about Breath of the Wild was slipping on rocks in the rain, and this problem has not been resolved at all. Now, thankfully, it barely matters now, but it is still annoying sometimes. You can technically find armor and then upgrade it to prevent yourself from slipping, but it's so much effort to do that that it's not even worth going for. A lot of these shrines also now require you to carry this green gem from a faraway place to reach it. This was a new and novel idea at first, until I did it like 15 times in a row, and then the concept started to get stale. And strangely enough, Korok Seeds had the exact same mechanic. To get two Korok Seeds, at once, some missions require you to carry one Korok to the other, and these carrying missions are kind of tedious when repeated so many times over. In fact, there's 1,000 Korok seeds, which is just too much. 900 in Breath of the Wild was already too much, but no, let's just add more of them this time. I do also want to touch on the story too, because this has to be the worst part of the game. To put it bluntly, it makes no f sense. Tears of the Kingdom takes place after the events of Breath of the Wild, so you would assume that all the NPCs and characters would remember Link, right? No, of course not! Half of the NPCs you talk to have no idea who Link is. Like, how is that even possible? I saved the goddamn world and you don't know who Link is. What, do you live under a rock? And then of course there's that Ganondorf face from the ninth memory, and I'm not gonna lie, that sh was cracking me up. And then Zelda ends up turning into a dragon to help Link defeat Ganondorf in the future, but we're told that doing this is completely irreversible. This whole dragon thing meant that there's no coming back, and your entire memory and self is just wiped. But then after beating Ganondorf, she somehow transforms back into a human and remembers everything! What the hell happened to the plot? Now, sure, there is an explanation for how this worked at the end, but I'm not believing that plot armor. Look, I'm not that much of a stickler with story and video games, like I don't care at all if it's good or bad most of the time, but I was genuinely bewildered at what was happening in Tears of the Kingdom's story, like seriously. But at least the final boss was really damn good. You go through Hyrule Castle's chasm, make your way through a narrow and freaky cave, only to fight hordes of enemies, and then have a one-to-one -one sword fight with Ganondorf. While I did cheese the fight a little bit by spamming arrows, I loved this final fight. It just feels so personal and vengeful. And then the last section where Link's dragon girlfriend flies him towards the weak spots on Ganon Dragon, oh, it was a fantastic ending, despite the fact that the story is super confusing. I think the best way to summarize Tears of the Kingdom is that it has some of the greatest ideas I've ever seen come from a video game while simultaneously executing them in the wonkiest ways imaginable. I really love Tears of the Kingdom, despite all the 
weird small quirks that it has. It's just kind of overwhelming to take in. I mean, I've spent the most time talking about this game in this video because of how much stuff's included. So for that, I don't think it quite tops Breath of the Wild, but I'm very, very curious to see what the next 3D Zelda will be like. 4. The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap For most of my life, I've been hearing that this is an incredible game, and after playing through, I finally get it. This is one of, if not my absolute favorite 2D Zelda game. There's so much to cherish about the Minish Cap. Let's just start with how it looks. When it comes to pixel art, I've always loved how games look on the Game Boy Advance. They're just intricate enough to where the graphics are at a point of having well-done shadows and highlights that breathe life into the atmosphere. So not only is the Minish Cap a beautiful looking game, but it is damn well animated. Just look at Link running around and swinging his sword. It looks awesome. Animation with a character's movement is vital to making characters feel fluid to control, and the Minish Cap is one of the best feeling Zelda games. And you also get a roll right from the get-go, which is just icing on the cake. I mean, just look at his little hat that bobs up and down when he's running. I can't get enough of it. Now, the main gimmick for this Zelda game is that you can shrink down to a tiny size. While this isn't a new idea, the way that it's utilized in the Minish Cap is ingenious. You can be small in the main overworld, which just looks so goofy. You're literally like two dots and that's it. It kind of reminds me of Mario from the LEGO Mario 64 set, but that's just one part. You'll often need to shrink down and visit really tiny areas. And these areas make everything look huge, almost like that old Honey, I Shrunk the kids movie. The grass is massive. There's a scene where raindrops are deadly. You'll sneak up on top of ceilings and floorboards. It's literally like living the life of an ant. It's incredible. I also love how this game cuts through all the bullshit and just gets to the point right away. There is a story, of course, but you start the first dungeon within 30 minutes of playing. That just doesn't happen with most Zelda games. It often takes forever to get the ball rolling, so that's refreshing. And speaking of the story, it's all about body. There's no surprise Ganon cameo as far as I'm aware. He just turns Zelda into stone and you have to power up your sword to save her. The Minish Cap is a bit of a shorter game, but I'm completely okay with that. What we have here is so well condensed and put together that I wouldn't want the Minish Cap to be any longer than it is. As for the side characters, well, your hat talks to you. His name is Ezlo, and I don't have much to say about him. He always seems to be a little snarky, but that's about it. The combat, as you'd expect, feels great, and the items are the typical things for the most part. One of the more unique ones, however, is the Mole Miz, which let you dig through dirt. It really reminds me of Kirby's animal ability when he becomes a furry in Squeak Squad. But that's besides the point. The item swapping is also not really a problem, because you don't need to swap things around as often compared to games like Link's Awakening or the Oracle titles. The only enemies I didn't enjoy fighting were the Dark Nuts, as they were constantly on the defense. They're just inherently more satisfying to fight in 3D. I don't think you can do much about that in a 2D plane. Since Capcom developed this game, there's a surprising amount of Mario enemies in here. I spotted Lekitu and bob -Ohm, just to name a few. It's always so jarring to see them popping up from time to time. There's really only two things I can think of that I didn't really care for. For one, there wasn't very much original music. Minish Village is a peaceful and comfy tune, but there wasn't much beyond that. The Minish Cap has a lot of the same Zelda songs that are in every game, and I don't necessarily hate that, but a bit more variety would have been nice. Then there's the collectibles. The main ones are the kinstones and figurines. The kinstones are kind of interesting. You randomly find most of them and have to match these together with NPCs or objects around you. Once you do this, something good happens in the game or something will unlock. So while this is a cool idea, it is frustrating having a ton of kinstones and you run into somebody that doesn't have a match somehow. Then there's the figurines. These are a complete waste of time. To get these, you need to find seashells, and then you put these seashells into a trophy capsule machine. The more figurines you get, the harder it is to collect new ones, meaning you have to spend more seashells to get them. It's basically Melee's trophy lottery. It's a bunch of bullshit. I did find it very funny with just how fast the minecarts are. Like seriously, look at how f***ing fast these things are going. The final boss with body was really fun too, especially those last couple of phases. Something I really appreciate this boss, as well as the dungeons, is that they all do a great job utilizing most of the items. They aren't typically used for just one dungeon and that's it, they're used in dozens and dozens of scenarios. The dungeons themselves were great too, I really enjoyed the sky one in particular. So hot mama, the Minish Cap is a really great one probably the only pixel-based Zelda game that's truly worth going back to. 3. The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds 
Sometime in 2013, I was given this game as a gift, but I never really touched it outside of a few minutes. Little did I know that I was holding one of the best Zelda games ever made. I know that seems crazy for a 3DS Zelda title that most people don't really talk about anymore, but man, right off the bat, the controls are super smooth. After playing so many Zeldas that either had outdated controls or ran at poor frame rates, it felt really refreshing to play something that ran at a clean 60 FPS and felt great in the hands. The huge difference really comes down to the pure 360 degree movement. It makes the entire game feel so much better. The map screen also has to be my favorite from the entire franchise. It's incredibly easy to navigate, it's nice and colorful, and you can add in your own markers. And you know what else is f***ing awesome about A Link Between Worlds? It gets to the goddamn point. There's no 50 hour tutorials or movie filled cutscenes to sit through, the game begins almost immediately. Now it should be noted that I'm definitely biased towards games that focus more on gameplay than story, so that's why this was such a huge deal for me. And don't get me wrong, the plot does get fairly compelling at the very end, but it doesn't drag the entire experience down. You simply go from overworld to dungeon and it's very snappy and to the point. And to be honest, this is a pretty short game. It took me about 9 to 10 hours to finish, which I much prefer in most circumstances. There's no filler content included at all. And what's even better is fast traveling is possible almost right away. Thank God you don't have to play like halfway through before being able to fly around. And I haven't even gotten to the main gimmick yet, and that's being able to turn into a painting and walk on the walls. It sounds like it would be confusing, but it's surprisingly simple and easy to understand. It's a really interesting concept and creates puzzles in the dungeons I never would have considered before. The only comparison I can make to this mechanic is, I guess, Super Paper Mario? But even that isn't really the same idea. There were so many different puzzles that just blew my mind when I realized what had to be done involving the walls. It's really great stuff. The only dungeons I wasn't a super big fan of was the Turtle Rock, as the seesaws got a little troublesome to navigate at times, but otherwise, all the dungeons were a 10 out of 10. There's a few new characters, of course, one of those being Hilda, who controls Low Roll. Oh man, gotta love the puns, Nintendo. Low Roll, haha, very funny. And then Hilda, haha, you know what? You should have just called her Helda. Then you've got Ravio, who's an interesting fella, who's definitely not Nabbit in an alternate timeline. Oh, no, no, no. I thought it was hilarious that he just over took my house to make his store too, only to later learn that he's evil Link? What the heck? The other huge change this game offers is being able to buy just about every item at the beginning, and then visit the dungeons in whatever order you want it. This was kind of the first step to Nintendo developing more of a sense of open-worldness like with Breath of the Wild. I honestly hope every future Zelda does this in the future. It makes exploring so much more enjoyable and less restrictive. And then the rupees. There's some Zelda games where finding them in grass takes freaking forever, but that's not the case in this one. By the end, I had like 5,000 rupees, and that was after renting every item. This game coats you in money, and I think it was probably for the best. While I've been singing the praises for a while, there are two very small issues that I have to address. For one, it is a little disappointing that the overworld is ripped right from A Link to the Past. While it's cool to see it get remade, it would have been better to just have something brand new. And second, the bosses are way too easy. And I mean way too easy. Like half the time, I'm not even bothering to avoid their attacks, and I'm just hitting them as aggressively as possible knowing I'll be fine. While the bosses are fun, especially Stallbind with having to paint yourself onto a shield, they take no effort at all. Even with Yuga at the end, I mostly just slashed away at the sword and only used one fairy bottle. The bosses really should have dealt more damage. I know there's a hero mode that you unlock at the end, but I think even for normal this could have been a little bit tougher. But those two small nitpicks aside, this was such an incredible game to play. I'll be remembering this one for years. 2. The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker HD For the people that weren't fans of the original GameCube version, it'd be hard to not be happy with the tweaks and updates this remake has. As you'd expect, there's gamepad support which allows you to swap items on the fly and peek at your map without pausing. You can also see every Wind Waker song when you're about to play something, so it's pretty handy all around. The visuals are obviously a big step up, the game is in widescreen and they added a sh ton of bloom, which I do think could be a bit overkill at times, but it still looks really clean. Although I wonder if they should have toned down the bloom, because there were more frame drops than I was expecting there to be. It wasn't often enough to where it hindered the game at all, but at the same time, I'm pointing it out because it happened occasionally. 
But really, there's two huge updates that make the Wind Waker an even better experience. One, you can unlock the Swift Sail. This drastically improves the speed of your sail, and also removes the necessity of changing the direction of the wind. The second big improvement is motion control aiming. Being able to aim your arrows or hook shots with the slight tilt of your wrist makes it so much easier to shoot. These aren't the only new updates, however. The other ones are kind of just whatever. You can get Tingle Bottles, which offer hints through Miiverse, except for the fact that Miiverse doesn't work anymore, so they're kind of completely useless now. And you can also collect Tingle Statues. These really come in handy at the end of the game when you're getting the Triforce Shards, but they're also kind of pointless at the same time. In the GameCube version, you had to find eight Triforce Charts, and you'd give those to Tingle so he could decipher them. That's all fine and dandy, except that Tingle charges an exuberant amount of rupees to decipher each chart. But in the Wii U version, you find five Triforce Shards out in the open and only three charts. And the Tingle Statues brings in rupees to make the price cheaper. So what's the point of that when paying for three charts is much more manageable compared to the eight charts on the GameCube? It's really not a big deal, and I could be missing something here, but I don't see the incentive to look for the Tingle Statues unless you want 100% completion. There are a few other small changes here and there that aren't really worth mentioning, but yeah. The Wind Waker HD is absolutely incredible and makes the GameCube version not really worth playing, despite it being one of the best Zelda games of all time. 1. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild Nintendo outdid themselves yet again. Like with Ocarina of Time in the 90s, Nintendo evolved a genre that nobody was really pursuing at the time. Open world games have been around for a while, but the scope of them was always so limited and you couldn't actually go anywhere you wanted. Breath of the Wild, however, is completely different. You see that mountain out in the distance? Go climb it for fun. Anywhere that you want to go, you can actually go. It's one of those games where the magic can only be experienced once, but that first time is simply unforgettable and magical. Not only does Breath of the Wild evolve open world games to a scale so high that many people are copying them now, but they also completely changed how Zelda games work, which some people are not a fan of, but I'm not in that boat. As for how Breath of the Wild plays, well, it's kind of tricky to describe, honestly. The reason for that is because everyone plays Breath of the Wild differently, so I've decided to kind of document my experience as I'm going along. After getting the paraglider, some weapons, and food, I started to scour my way around for shrines. Shrines are kind of like a super mini dungeon, where you'll solve a few puzzles or fight a guardian and then you'll get a spirit orb. These orbs allow you to add more hearts and increase your stamina. So you have a lot of incentive to complete and hunt for these shrines because you're going to want extra health and stamina for better climbing and longer gliding time. Now, I've heard a lot of people complain about the weapons breaking. While I do think it's kind of dumb how quickly some of them break, it's not really much of an issue because they're everywhere. You will never not be able to find decent weapons, so I don't really think it's that big of a deal. If anything, it's more annoying that the Master Sword needs time to recharge after using it. What the hell kind of sword gets tired? But yeah. The main weapons you'll use are swords and bow and arrows. Both of these are really fun to use in combat. You can even use gyro aiming with the arrows, which I really like for that extra accuracy. It's pretty much a standard for Zelda games at this point. The best part of using the bow, though, is jumping off something, and then the game goes into slow motion, giving you some extra time to aim your bow shots. This looks kind of confusing, but is incredibly intuitive and addicting to pull off, especially when fighting the Guardians. They're probably the most enjoyable enemies to fight paired with Lynels, but a lot of the other enemies are just kind of there. It feels like you see the same basic Bacoblins a bit too often, but at the very least you can take their items and weapons when defeated. But then you'll run into an issue with your inventory. One, because there's not really a good way to organize everything, but you don't have a lot of slots to hold items with. That is where Korok Seeds come into play. You'll find these in the overworld by solving very tiny puzzles like examining glowflies or kicking a rock over. There's 900 of these things, and you don't need to get all of them, but man are they a joy to find. You'll use these seeds to add slots to your inventory, so again, Again, you have a reason to look for all this stuff. Everything you do in this game, whether that be the combat, shrines, Korok seeds, climbing the watchtowers, all of them serve a meaningful purpose. You're gracefully awarded for exploring the world at your own pace because all of your items have some sort of use. That's another thing. The watchtowers are really fun to reach because you can easily see them from the distance. And when you climb up top, you can then see that entire region of land. That's how I started with Breath of the Wild. I just looked for all these towers so I could just see everything and completed any shrines that I ran into along the 
way. Your map is pretty useful as well, which I know is a weird thing to comment on, but a lot of games get map systems wrong, so I applaud Nintendo for doing a good job with this one. On the map, you can see every shrine and tower you've been to, and even better, they're fast travel spots. So even though the world is huge, you can fast travel pretty quickly. Well, I say quickly, but the loading screen does tend to sit there for a bit longer than I'd want it to. You can also add markers which show up on your mini-map, there's a shrine detector you can turn on and off, plus many more options on top of that. And I haven't even gotten into the runes yet. Like seriously, there is so much neat stuff to go over. The runes are abilities Link gets from his Sheikah Slate at the beginning of the game. You have bombs that you can spawn infinitely, Magnesis, which lets you carry metallic objects, Stasis stops the flow of time for objects, Cryonis lets you make ice pillars and water, and there's also a camera. These all feel very intuitive to use. Stasis is the most fascinating by far because you can hit objects that stop in time, and basically force them to hold in momentum until the chains break free. The runes are used heavily in the shrines, and there's a ton of really creative puzzles. What makes shrines so cool is that there isn't just one way to do a puzzle, there are tons of solutions. Seriously, get as creative as you want. If you can think up some bizarre solution to solve something, chances are you can probably do it. The sense of freedom is unparalleled in this game. It's kind of crazy that Nintendo even pulled this off. As for the graphics, well, it looks okay. This is running on the Switch, so I'm not that surprised, but the art style is decent, I guess. I'm not much of a stickler for graphics, but there's spots here and there where the pop-in is really bad and the frame rate dips really low. It's not very often, but it should be noted that it does come up. After sinking 140 hours into Breath of the Wild, I was really starting to get tired of the desaturated look that's carried throughout. There's lots of greens and browns which perfectly suit the theme since the idea is to feel isolated with most things being destroyed by Ganon, but I missed seeing my bright vibrant colors. You're listening to a guy that sunk 900 hours into Splatoon 2. But once I got all the watchtowers unlocked, I basically just completed all the main quests, went through and did every single shrine, and did some of the Korok seeds and side quests. Despite how long it took to do all all this, I was having an amazing time up until about the very end. And that's mostly just because grinding for dragon horns or items to upgrade my gear wasn't that fun, but that was a tiny portion of my playtime. There is so much depth and complexity that we haven't really seen in Zelda until now. Even just cooking stuff is fun. The food that you collect along the way can be mixed together and turned into recipes which may enhance your abilities. It was a little intimidating mixing and matching foods and having no idea what they do, but if you just read the descriptions, you can probably come up with some pretty awesome concoctions. I do wish there was a more readily available recipe book, especially after you discover a recipe in case you want to make it again. And I also really don't get the point of elixirs. It's somewhat similar to cooking, but I only use them a handful of times. I was also not a fan of the rain. Oh yeah, you already know what I'm gonna say here. There you are, just trying to climb up some mountain, it starts raining, and then you slip all the way to the bottom. It is a pain in the ass, and is only remedied once you complete the main dungeons. There's not even special equipment you can wear to prevent sliding. It's just gonna happen no matter what you do. But speaking of the dungeons, there's four of them in this game, and a lot of Zelda fans didn't really like them. And now that I've played each dungeon, I totally get the sentiment. They all kind of feel the same. I mean, the puzzles themselves are still fun to complete and they're creative, but they aren't all that hard and each dungeon just kind of looks like the others. The boss fights are also super easy once you know what to do, but again, I think that's another strength Breath of the Wild has. When it comes to a typical Zelda game, you use one key item and hit the right spot to win. In Breath of the Wild, you have to figure out which weapons are going to work against which boss. This makes the combat feel fresh and dynamic, even if it is a bit easy. I really only got stumped on Thunderblight Ganon at first, but the others were a cakewalk. But once you do beat the dungeons, you'll get even more abilities to help out. The most useful one being Ravali's Gale, where a gust of wind blows from underneath you and you start gliding through the air. I actually got this ability last and I kind of wish that I didn't because it would have saved a big headache when it came to the rain, but it's not that big of a deal. It's still a blast trying to climb your way up tall mountains, and the other abilities you get make the flow of the gameplay even better. There's also amiibo, and there's really not much to say about them. Most of the time, you'll scan one in and you get a bunch of random items, but some of them may spawn unique outfits. Or with the Wolf Link amiibo, you get Wolf Link as a partner character, which is pretty cool. You can also get Epona, and uh, oh yeah, there's horses in this game. The horses are, uh, well, let's just say, oh, how do I put this? Uh, completely unnecessary. 
So basically, you can raise horses from the wild and make them your partner, but in order to use them, you have to be close to a stable. What's the point of that when you can fast travel and glide anywhere? But it's still a lot of fun just finding a horse and adapting it as your companion. And I've really just covered basic stuff here. There's also a ton of side quests to complete and memories to unlock. The side quests are fun for the most part, but I didn't find much of a reason to finish them since the reward is usually worthless. I like hearing the backstories of the other characters, but they didn't really hook me enough to play every side quest. The memories give you more access to more of the story, which is kind of cool, but also the story is just okay. I can only imagine how challenging it is trying to make a story for a game like this when there's no linearity whatsoever. I mean, you can just run up and fight Ganon if you really wanted to from the very beginning. The story involves Link waking up with none of his memories, and has to break Zelda free from Calamity Ganon and free the four champions. This takes place before every Zelda timeline, which is weird because characters like Beetle are here, but that's the main gist. And on top of that, there's actual voice acting. And while parts of it were a bit corny, I was honestly tearing up once we saw Hyrule Castle restored and watching Zelda try to save Link from a deadly Guardian Blast. So it's an okay plot, but it feels much more on the sideline compared to everything else. The last thing I'll bring up is the DLC, which came in two waves. This was kind of controversial when first announced because the idea of a Zelda game having DLC is completely foreign. But honestly, you don't really need to get it to still feel like you got the full experience, because most of the DLC is just fun small things. A lot of it is bonus treasure chest, some costumes, and things like that. However, it is pretty stupid that the master mode is locked behind DLC, which of course is a more challenging version of the game. I never tried it personally, but if you're looking for a challenge, then this is right up your alley. The big thing the first DLC pack has is the Trial of the Sword, which is basically a way to double the Master Sword's powers. That ability is kind of worthless because you can still do this in the base game by just upgrading your champion's tunic, but if you want a challenge, then holy f Trial of the Sword gives it to you. You have to take on 45 unforgiving floors with none of your weapons or champion abilities. It's a really fun, arcadey type of trial that will kick you in the balls if you haven't mastered combat and efficiently use weapons. I got about an hour in, accidentally blew myself up with a remote bomb, and then got a game over. Oh, and uh, there are no saves, so I was pretty over it at that point. DLC 2 is a little more substantial, mostly thanks to two things. You can get the Travel Medallion, which will let you fast travel anywhere on the map, so obviously that's beyond useful and very convenient to have if you're trying to farm a certain item. Then there's also the Champions Ballad. This gives you 16 new shrines, these being some of the best in the entire game. A lot of completing this requires being stealthy and taking out enemies without being seen by the others. It gets quite exhilarating, and the final trial is by far the best so-called dungeon in the game. And after that is a pretty crazy boss. So throughout this whole game, this monk guy gives you the spear orbs after beating a shrine, so that's all nice and dandy. But for whatever reason, the monk in this final trial wants to fight you, and then he gives you a motorcycle when you win. And this vehicle, as goofy as it looks in the ancient landscape, is so much fun to use. But at the same time, it further reduces the need for a horse, because the motorcycle is on the Sheikah Slate, so it can be spawned anywhere at any time. So I really enjoyed the DLC, but I also feel like you don't have to get it. Because holy crap, if you haven't played Breath of the Wild, then you really should. It is mind-boggling how incredible this game is. Really, the main thing that this new open-world Zelda needs to fix in the future is to just make the dungeons more linearly structured. We can have the best of both worlds, Nintendo. It's very possible. After playing all these Zelda games, I've come to realize something. I don't think I'm that big of a Zelda fan. Now, don't get me wrong, there were tons of moments that were magical and unforgettable, but I just felt this drag of doing the same kind of things over and over and over again. And getting lost just felt frustrating. Find the dungeon, get the item, fight the boss, do the side quest for heart pieces, and just repeat for forever. I don't know, maybe I just played too much Zelda over the past two years, that's also possible, but I'm still really glad that I played all these games despite how long it took so I could become further invested in the community and be able to properly respect what each game has to offer. And with that, thanks for watching.